Hello and welcome to episode number 33 of the Wise Guys podcast. My name is John Tortorelli with my co-host Brandon Gabazzello and Justin Ray. Today we have week five of the NFL season to basically preview. And the fact it's week five is just ridiculous to say it's been over a month now. Starting with Thursday Night Football tonight, Broncos or the Colts at the Broncos. Then we're going to shift over to London football with the Packers playing the Giants. And let me tell you, the Giants are not favored in that matchup. Then we got the Rams versus the Cowboys at 4 o'clock. Eagles versus Cardinals Sunday night. ASU North smash math football. Ravens versus the Cincinnati Bengals. Then we're going to shift over to week five of our NFL pick em. We're going to go over our picks, how we did last week, how we're going to do this week. And last but not least, we have the Northwest Division of the NBA to preview for the 2022-23 season. NBA basketball is just one and a half weeks away, like 11, 12 days. And that's crazy to say that NBA, uh, NBA preseason is already here. But enough of me talking. How are you two doing today? Week five, man. I don't know if I should feel happy or sad because next thing you know, the NFL season is going to be over. But I'm feeling good, guys. How are you, Joe? I'm chilling like a straight villain. Let's get into it, guys. So starting off tonight, we have the Colts going to the mile high to face off Russell Wilson and a struggling Broncos team that is still 2-2, two and two, whereas the Colts last week lost versus the Titans in a game where Matt Ryan went off for 350-plus passing yards. That Colts passing attack is rolling. Mo Alley Cox, Alec Pierce, the other tight end, Granson, and... The crazy thing was Michael Pittman only had 31 yards and it was still rolling, but there's some issues with that rushing attack and the offensive line that is very much overrated. I'm going to start with you, Brandon, the guy who has been a staunch Broncos or really Russell Wilson advocate through all these struggles. Who do you have winning today? And more importantly, whatever team that loses, is it time to panic for them given how the season started? Yeah, I'm happy you corrected yourself because not a Denver Broncos fan at all. Um, I'm just a fan of Russell Wilson, and I'm going to defend him because it's uh, annoying what's happening to him right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, for this game, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Shaq Leonard and Jonathan Taylor for the Indianapolis Colts are out for today, and Javante Williams and Randy Gregory for the Denver Broncos are out. The Broncos did sign Latavius Murray. If you remember, he played for the – New Orleans Saints just about what four days ago on Sunday so um, there's some shifting around going on on both teams both are missing uh, key players probably the Colts a little bit more effective with Shaq Leonard arguably their best defender and Jonathan Taylor without a doubt probably their best player on the team maybe him and Quentin Nelson arriving each other I know Nelson's having a down year but I'm gonna I'm gonna pick Denver this week uh, for tonight, uh, the Colts have not looked impressive. Denver's not looked impressive. Both teams have been disappointing to everybody. Um, a lot of teams had the Broncos, you know, challenging with the Chiefs and Chargers as the number one team in the AFC West. A lot of people, including myself, and I think everybody on this show here, picked the Indianapolis Colts to win the division of the AFC South. Neither look really likely right now, if we're going to be honest. The Jaguars look like they're – I mean, they're not in control, but they, they've they looked like the much better team for the first four weeks. And Denver is probably, what, the third best team in the AFC uh, West. But there's a considering drop-off between the Chargers, who have also – they've been ravaged with injuries, though. So wh- when I look at it, I'm just, I'm just going to – I'm going to – Take the Broncos. I'm going to have my faith in Russell Wilson. I'm going to retract my statement. John um, hit me with a fact last week or last episode that Jerry Judy only had one drop this season. And um, I, I tried to look up that stat. I couldn't find it. But I, I know that his drops have gone down from his rookie season where he had 10 drops his rookie season. I believe one drop last year. And if um, I'm going to believe John on this, there's only been one drop this year. So. He's cleaned that up, but he needs to be more consistent on the field. After that one big game in week one, it's kind of been eh, a little bit. I'm pretty sure he found the end zone last week or or something like that. I think he's found the end zone uh, after week one, but it's just, it's not been, he has not taken the step like the other guys in his draft class, like a Michael Pittman who was taken after him, Justin Jefferson, 
Um, there's another one that I'm forgetting, but T Higgins. Yeah. T Higgins. So he hasn't taken that step and it's just, I, I need him to step up and I know people are going to say, well, Brandon Russell Wilson also needs to elevate him. It's true, but you know, it works both ways. They both got to elevate each other up and, Right now, Jerry, Judy, and Cortland Sutton, for me, are not getting the job done for Russell Wilson. And uh, Melvin Gordon, I mean, the four fumbles through through uh, four games is just not good. He's only lost two of them, but you're putting the ball on the floor at a very high rate. That's not okay. It, it needs to be cleaned up. He's going to be taking the starting back this week, um, but there's a reason they signed Latavius Murray. He's an insurance policy if Melvin Gordon puts the ball on the floor again. Melvin Gordon might not see the uh, the field for the rest of the game uh, tonight. So I, I, I'm going to put my face in, faith in Russell Wilson, not putting my faith in Nathaniel Can't Hack It because he's just – the coaching um, levels on both teams, it's just Frank Wright is a way better head coach than Nathaniel Hackett. Uh, one more thing, and then I'll kick it to either John or Justin, whoever wants to take it. Russell Wilson right now, he's been sacked 12 times through four games. That's seventh in the NFL, and he's been hit 28 times. The offensive line is not getting the job done. Yeah, you're right. They're, they're not getting the job done. But as we've mentioned before, that whole team really hasn't been stepping up to the plate. Uh, it takes Obviously, it's more than one guy. It's not all on Russ, but it's a, it's a team effort there. And if the team isn't putting it all in, then that's the results you're going to get. But with the – with Jonathan Taylor out, with Shaq Leonard out for the Colts, and John already mentioned their passing attack was rolling last week, 350-plus passing yards for Matt Ryan. Shows he still has a little bit left in the tank in that arm. Um, I still can't roll with the Colts. I think losing Jonathan Taylor is big time. So I'm going Broncos country. Let's ride. Let's ride. Because I, I really think <laughs> – I know John like that. But I, I, honestly, I saw Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton, while they didn't light the world on fire, uh, they were your best receivers on the field the other day. Even though it was a losing effort in, in Vegas, they both found the end zone, which is something to be optimistic about. And going into this game, I believe it's at home, correct me. If, yes, it is at home. It's in mile high. Russ is dealing with a little shoulder issue, but he's, he's more than fine to play tonight. I think the Broncos get it rolling tonight. I think the Colts are very vulnerable, and it's time to kick them while they're down. John said before this, um, is this panic mode for whichever team that loses? If Denver were to lose this game, I, I don't panic just yet. Um, but if the Colts were, you're falling to one, three, and one. Uh, you, you really don't look that good. You're going against some teams that, you know, one play away from pro probably winning some games. So you can't even pull out these one score games. And quite frankly, I don't think they have the weapons on offense to get them over the top. So I could see this being another one score game for the Colts and the Broncos, but I think the Broncos ultimately come out on top. I think Melvin Gordon finds, finds himself because he's still a very good running back. The, the fumble issues, the butterfingers, that he'll, he should clear that up. But like you said, Latavius Murray is now in the fold, and Latavius Murray is a tough runner. He is a tough runner. Had a solid game against Minnesota the other week. Um, so I'm going to roll with the Broncos. Don't forget to watch it. It's on Amazon Prime. So if you guys don't know where to watch it, I got you. The Amazon Prime, I don't have a problem with it per se, but for like the generation of fans that maybe aren't familiar with technology, it is kind of messed up that they just lose Thursday night football, which is so accessible to an app or like, if you don't know how to set up an Amazon Prime account, and by the way, you get like a free month if you don't know that, then like you're just going to mess out on Thursday night entirely. So be sure if you haven't to go, you know, actually get the free one month and then you can see it for yourself. So to just to bring a point to that, um, uh, somebody I work with, my coworker, he's an older guy, uh, late fifties, and he hasn't been able to watch Thursday night football because he didn't know it was on Amazon. And, um, you know, he doesn't really, you know, technology wise, like John was saying that generation, they don't really know that much. You know what I mean? They're not on Twitter. They're not on Instagram. How are they finding out this news? So I, I would, I would, they're never going to, they're probably never going to release it unless it's like an insanely high number so they can sing their praises of the actual viewership because that's how streaming people work. They don't really like Netflix. Netflix will say how much the Jeffrey Dahmer 
series was uh, watched, right? Because it's the highest watched thing, but they won't tell you the other stuff because they don't want you to know how bad the other stuff is doing. It's, you know, but go ahead, John. At the end of the day, I know a lot of people are blaming Frank Reich for the Colts issues. This offensive line has been trash. Quentin Nelson, the last two years, has just not been the same player, and it's only gotten worse and worse. Ryan Kelly at center. Last week against Tennessee, Jeffrey Simmons, for as incredible as he has been over the last two or three years, he looked like Aaron Donald. And that's the biggest concern I have with this Colts team because now we're starting to see Matt Ryan as a passer just do his thing. But at his age, that guy goes down so easily. If you get to him, he's not going to evade pressure like a Zach Wilson did all week long against the Steelers. And for the Colts, against this Broncos defense, for as much as I hate to go with the worst head coach, Patrick Sertan is one of, if not the best, young corner. Maybe outside of A.J. Terrell and Trayvon Diggs has been falling at a crazy high level. But I do have a lot of optimism in this Broncos defense, and I think it will be a very close game. And I say all of that just to let you know I still have the Colts winning. At the end of the day, coaching does matter, and I think Frank Reich, he's going to do his thing. He's going to have Matt Ryan clicking. The play calling has been better. But I do think it'll be down to the very last wire. 24-21 Colts. See what I did there? With no Jonathan Taylor, though? He had 41 yards last week, less than two yards a carry. It doesn't matter, though, how bad he's playing. It's still a threat when he's on the field. And now that threat is gone. So now the defense is like, all right, it's open house on Matt Ryan. And you have just said how bad that offensive line is. Now, Denver's defense i mean bradley chubb has been a complete disappointment since year one <coughs> excuse me he hasn't played a full season since week one he has his most sacks since uh, i mean not week one sorry he hasn't played a full season since year one and year one he had 12 sacks and then after that it's just been downhill he had one seven and a half sack season where he played 14 games but other than that it's just been a complete disappointment Fun fact, the Colts have the – they've been moving the football, but they have the least yards per game this year, 14.2. Less than uh, the Bears. I should say Matt Ryan has been hit 33 times, and that's third in the NFL. In part, that's to him, but it's also the offense. Yeah. One. So Denver's got to get after it. The D-line, I mean, the, the O-lines the, – both O-lines are there to be had by both teams. So it, it, it's – I just think the – the Denver, the Denver offense is less affected by the injuries. They've still got some players on the field. Matt Ryan, it's basically Michael Pittman and who else? Well, Alec Pierce at 80 yards last week and Mo Ali Cox, freaking mm. tight end playing. They have so much size there between him and the rookie Jelani Woods. It's pretty ridiculous. Mo, the- Mo Ali Cox is underrated, man. It's, it's going to be interesting because uh, Sertain is probably going to line up head-to-head with Michael Pittman. And then you're going to be able to shift coverage to, you know, you can basically say, Sertain, you got him. Now we got 10 other people to be able to work against 10 v 10. So it's like, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. Darius Slay jumped on pick aside and he said, I'm taking notes from his game. That's a long time, nine year NFL vet taking notes from a second year player. It's like 23 years old. It speaks volumes to how great he's going to be. Now we're going to shift over to Londra. Packers versus Giants. Brand and I have a. F- Did you say Londra or? <laughs> I was wondering. London. You mean Even London? Italian. That's what it is. Oh, oh I was. I've been using Duolingo, guys. Come on, stop embarrassing me. <laughs> Nobody's embarrassing. You just said some word. And- <laughs> Unbelievable. So, the Packers. I'm gonna pull up the exact on the ESPN app in a brief moment. Our favorites in this game. Minus eight and a half. Minus eight and a half. That's a little bit surprising to me, but it seems like the Giants more likely than now are going to roll out with Davis Webb because Daniel Jones, while they're optimistic he may play, in the past he's had hamstring issues, then he goes out there in the field, he's not himself, then he has a high ankle sprain. And for a Giant team that's trying to evaluate him, I think it's a terrible look with the current offensive line to throw him out there against a Packers defense that for as much as it's underperformed still has a lot of talent on it. There's no question about that. So I'm expecting Davis Webb to be out there. Tyrod Taylor's in concussion protocol. I don't know if he'll be back in time. He got rocked on Sunday. Wishing him and Teddy Bridgewater have just had the absolute worst injury luck. Justin, 
I want to start with you because you're the one who doesn't have any, uh, let's say, agenda going into this game. Who do you have winning? Oof, this is actually a tough one. Uh, but if Daniel Jones is for certain out, uh, Brandon, you can roll your eyes all you want. If Daniel Jones is on the field, I think the Giants actually have a chance. Um, so I, I guess I really don't want to give you my prediction because I don't know who's under center. So let's just say this. If Daniel Jones is playing this Sunday, I am picking the Giants to beat the Packers. If he is not, I'm expecting the Packers to roll all over this team because they won't be able to put up points. Um, what, you know, Daniel Jones isn't lighting the world on fire. He's not. And he never will be. We all know it's clear as day that he's not the guy. But one thing that he does bring to the table is the guy can run. And for some reason, I don't understand why teams are still sleeping on that fact. Like the guy can run. Rush for two touchdowns against the Bears last week. Uh, unfortunately, the sprained ankle took him out and he, he was forced to come back into the game. But I think with him on the field, it makes the offense just a little bit more dynamic because of his athleticism. Pair that with Saquon Barkley, who's absolutely rolling, probably a top three running back in the league right now, going into the season. Right now, this at this point in the season, he's a top three back. Um, still trying to see who's going to step up for, in the receiver room because Kenny G paid all that money to him, and the guy's relatively a ghost. You know, Kadarius Tony, super talented, not being used to, to full capabilities, and Sterling Shepard is out for the year now. So who's going to step up in that receiver room? It's left to be seen. But this Giants defense is also playing tough. You know, they're playing very gritty football, no matter who they've gone up against. And while you can say, oh, they haven't really went up against any world beaters because they took on Cooper Rush and the Cowboys. They took they stopped Derrick Henry and the Titans. So you got to give them credit there. They stopped the Panthers, who had what we thought or Brandon thought was going to be a playoff team. Um so, I, I, you know what? I, I like the Giants, but if Daniel Jones is an under center, it's very tough for me to pick them. Oh, so I, gotta, go, I got it. Come on. I mean, I'm going to go with the Packers. Good. I mean, it's got Justin's acting like Daniel Jones is a world beater out here. That if he's I'm not. The, I literally just he, told you everything that he isn't. You, that he you is know, not you, the world beater. Do you know what his QBR is this season? I'm not saying. A he's 30, 35. You're muted, John. Nobody can hear you. What's 30, your boy Baker's QBR? We're not talking about Baker right now. Uh, we're talking about Daniel Jones and the you Green Bay Packers. We're talking about him. But time out. Against time Baker out. May, or time out. Time Daniel out. Jones? Time out. We're not talking about Baker Mayfield. And Baker Mayfield has won a playoff game. Daniel Jones done what? That's what I thought. All right. So through three weeks, if we take out that 92 QBR that he had last week against the Bears where he didn't play that much and he only had 71 yards passing and I think 11 pass attempts. So inconsequential there. You take that out. The first three weeks, his QBR is a 35, 35. And you're acting like, oh, if Daniel Jones plays, that they have a much better shot to win. They have this almost the you're same. You're telling exact, me they don't? Really? They have, I would say, a 5 to 10% better chance of winning the game with Daniel Jones. Because he's not, there's, the level between him and Webb is not that big. OK, it's not that big of a gap. Daniel Jones is not a starting caliber quarterback. He's yeah, a backup. You're telling me about a, a practice squad quarterback to somebody that's been starting in the league now. But is he a starting years. caliber quarterback? So, I don't give a crap. But he's not a practice squad quarterback. You're comparing. I didn't him to say he's a, he's a backup quarterback. Daniel well, Jones fine. is a backup quarterback. That is fine. You can say that. But the difference between Davis Webb under center and Daniel Jones under center it's amazing. huge. It's not huge. It's not huge. Like you're acting like it's Tom Brady and freaking Blaine Gabbert here. Like it's not okay. It's Daniel Jones and Davis Webb. Now, listen, the Packers run defense has been not that well. They rank like middle of the pack. I think they're averaging 126 yards allowed on them in, in the rushing game. So Saquon, it, it looks like he's primed to have a big game. But then again, like Justin said, the receivers on the Giants have been god awful. Daniel Jones is not a starting caliber quarterback. You could say he can run, but he cannot pass. So the Packers are going to be able to focus in on that run game. Will they be able to neutralize Saquon? We've seen it before. They've got some elite players. Maybe it happens. I see no way the Giants are winning this game. Whether Davis Webb is under quarterback, Daniel Jones is under quarterback, I don't, I don't care. They're not winning this game. Green Bay is going to win this game 
by eight points at least. Aaron Rodgers is going to have a great showing in London. He's going to have a little tea after the game. And that's it. So I got Green Bay, let's say 27 to 10, 27, 13. I have too much respect for Brian Dable to say that they're just only going to put up 10. I think that they're going to surprise a lot of people. Some gadget plays. You got to get creative to, to, to beat this Packers team especially when you're that capped on offense. I would imagine you have a lot of respect for Sean McVay too, right? Yes. Okay, well, they only put him nine points, right? So Uh that's – that's. And is their offense even close to the Rams' offense? I am talking about the Giants and Brian Dabble. I am not talking about anybody else. I'm making a comparison. I'm making a comparison. that they will come out very creative. They will surprise you guys a lot in the first half, and then we'll see. First half, it'll be competitive. I just hope it stays that way in the second. I've shocked you guys already with a couple of picks. I I should say, John, do have a friendly bet going on that. You guys said all of that. By minus eight, because John was talking his crap about the Patriots and how the Giants are in a better situation. So I said, put your money where your mouth is. I got the Packers. I give them eight points. So all the Giants have to do is not lose by eight points, and he wins. So I'm excited. You guys said all of that. Who's going to step up at receiver? Davis Webb that doesn't have a significant gap between him and Daniel Jones. Currently speaking, I mean, I don't know if there's any gap between Baker Mayfield and Carolina's backup, whether it's P.J. Walker or Sam Darnold and IR. Just... So find out on Sunday that the Giants are winning this football game. Kadarius Coney's back to practice. Adam boy. Coney. Adam boy. Did I say Kadarius Coney? I think you said Tony. Okay. Kadarius Tony, Wandell Robinson are both back to practice at the wide receiver spot. Leonard Williams is back to practice in limited fashion uh, due to his knee injury. This Giants pass rush, stopping the rush, is going to be key in this game. You have Dexter Lawrence, who has been a monster this year against the rush. And Aaron Jones hasn't even received the stacked box up until this point. Now, if you add in Leonard Williams into that equation with, look, let's say how it is. No one knows what Davis Webb is. So it sounds like I'm going crazy here by picking him to win over Aaron Rodgers. But Bailey Zappi almost beat Aaron Rodgers last week. And like Brand said, he was playing at Western Kentucky a year ago. This Giants team is so much better this year because Jason Garrett is not calling the plays. Freddie Kitchens is not calling the plays. It's actually Brian Dable maximizing Saquon Barkley, who has been a top three, top five back in the entire league this year. They're getting him out into open space. Meanwhile, Joe Bear on the other side is doing a terrible job on the Packers. The Packers go on Devontae Wyatt played five snaps last week. Quay Walker been terrible. They could have went receiver there. And they didn't, and it's looking to be a fool's errand by their GM and Brian Kudakumis. I don't know what he's doing. He clearly values defense more than offense, but their defense right now is not very good. It could be much better. And at the end of the day, I'm expecting Saquon, much like he did last year, Daniel Jones getting that crazy win over Jameis Winston and the New Orleans Saints to shock people in London. New York is coming home with a victory. And hey, let me say, I think they're this year's Panthers. But you can't deny the fact that Brian Dable is not Matt Rule. And when you have one of, so far, the best coaches through four weeks who has shown so much promise maximizing his player's skill sets, I have a lot of faith he's going to pull some crazy gadgets out on Sunday morning while you're probably sleeping, literally and figuratively. You know, you know, actually, I'm... I love you, John. I was the one. I was... (laughs) I, I was one of the only people who were able to be up in time to take Alvin Kamara out of my lineup in fantasy football last week and put Mark Ingram in. So I would, don't, don't be saying I'm sleeping. Um, but I do got to say, you say that Brian Dayball is not Matt Rule. And while I agree with that, Brian Dayball is nowhere near Bill Belichick. So for you to sit here and say Bailey Zappi almost beat Aaron Rodgers, it is because he had – the New England Patriot way, and Bill Belichick as his head coach. This so, team has more talent than the Patriots. In in which res- I mean, they have the best player. They on haven't either been team with Saquon. Yes, I Kedarius, give you that. Saquon is better. Saquon is better than anybody we have on our offensive side of the ball. I would say 
Patriots O-line is better than the Giants O-line. I would argue we have better depth in the running back room. We have two running backs that can get the job done at a pretty high level. We have the better tight end room. And receiver-wise, neither, neither of us have high-end talent. But who is their best receiver? Sterling Shepard, probably? No, well, he's now an IR. Let me say that. He is, I, and ours is Jacoby Myers, and I would take Jacoby Myers over Sterling Shepard. Much like you guys have depth, they have Richie James, Kenny Gallahu, 60 million guaranteed to have two catches at this point. That's pretty wild. Kadarius Tony is one of the most talented young players at his position. And we haven't seen what Wandell Moore, or Wandell Moore, Rondale, Rondale Robinson, another undersized speedster, can bring to this Giants offense as well. I, I could see him this weekend, a few gadgets as well. So, yeah, this Giants team has a lot of depth as well. And I think the biggest star here, Saquon, to go along with Kadarius Tony, I think this could be a big year for him if they can really get him going with Daniel. Yeah, but you're forgetting that the Packers also have Jair Alexander. And two, yeah, for some reason, two yeah, Pro Bowl. Joe Barry probably. refuses to use it, man. That's all right, but I mean, he's not going to have to lock in on one guy. He can move all over the field because there's not a, a true number one option that he has to worry about. And he's also got two high end Pro Bowl calibers, probably all pro safeties, and Amos um, or Amos and um, Savage. What's your guys' score prediction for this game? I got the Giants winning twenty four to twenty one. Same exact score as my previous pick. Uh, I said twenty seven to thirteen. 27 to 10, Packers. 26 24 with Daniel Jones on the field. Giants win on a walk off field goal. Good man. Good man. Maybe Kenny Galladay actually appears in this game. That'd be really cool. Nah, I think he's Dave Austin definitely, definitely doghoused him. <clears throat> Galladay is doubtful for this, for this Sunday, so I doubt it. Dude, a good point I missed. Yeah, I mean, it's not like they really have been missing him much this year. Anything else before we. Move over to our next game of the week. I'm just going to uh, just make it very clear to Brandon that I've picked underdogs over and over again this year, and I have been right quite a few times. Outside of the Broncos losing to the Texans. It's not right, John. You, um, it's an attack on Brandon. Right. I, I wasn't expecting the tag team. <laughs> That's on me. That's on me. My fault. Okay, so our next game is the Dallas Cowboys going to Los Angeles, two of the biggest teams in the National Football League, one that has disappointed exceedingly this year, while the other is coming off of three great weeks. Cooper Rush has yet to lose a start up until this point, and I have to give a tip of the cap to you know who? Do you guys know who I'm going to give a little credit to? I never thought I would have been doing this. Mike McCarthy? The Pittsburgh faithful himself. His ability to not lose this team when they lose their quarterback week one in embarrassing fashion on primetime speaks volumes to the coordinators he's put in place. Dan Quinn has done a great job in this Cowboys defensive front is just an absolute monster. Brandon call him a top 10 defense after week two. And I was scoffing at him, but that's what they've been. And honestly, the biggest storyline here has been Trayvon Diggs completely balling out this year. Sure. He hasn't had as many splash plays as he did a year ago. He had like five interceptions at this point. But at the end of the day, he's been shut down. That's all that matters on the outside with his ball skills. Got a question for you, Brandon. You have been high on the rims. Matthew Stafford has been dealing with a lot of problems this year that I saw you put on Twitter. Who do you have winning this game at 425 Sunday? I have – now, this is a – oh, man, it's an interesting game. I'm going to take the Rams, but I am weary of that pick. And I'm going to tell you why. And John alluded to me tweeting out the Rams problems in order last night. And number one on my list is the O-line. The O-line has been God awful. John, I'll give John his credit. He was right about that. The Andrew Whitworth uh, retirement and the, um, they lost a guard. Um, I forgot his name, but um, those have been very impactful on the Rams offensive line. And to show you that, I mean, it's been very, um, when it rains, it pours for the Rams O-line. Uh, Matthew Stafford is tied for second um, in amount of times he's been sacked this year with 16. And he, they've only allowed one sack in the Arizona game and the, in the Atlanta game, one sack in each game. But 
they allowed seven in both of their losses to the 49ers and the Bills. Um, it, it's just, he's Stafford has been hit 28 times this season. That's like, I think, fourth or fifth in the NFL. So the O-line has been a huge and major problem. Now, number two on my list is the lack of offensive creativity and it being too predictable. And the perfect example of that is we actually were reacting to this live on camera uh, when we were shooting our Monday show, Monday night show, and the Monday night football game was going on the 49ers uh, versus the Rams. And Justin brought it up when it happened, the pick six by the, um, uh, the young kid that I can't pronounce his name, but the kid that John likens to a Troy Palomalu. And I've heard that comparison before of that guy. Um, we got a pick six on Matthew Stafford. And I heard Keyshawn uh, Johnson talk about this on first take on um, Tuesday morning. And he said, this is ex the perfect example of this offense being way too predictable and there's no real creativity. And it's surprising to be saying that about a Sean McVay offense. The reason that kid was able to do that play, get that pick six, is because it was Cooper Cup lined up there. And this kid has been doing his homework on film. And he knows that, oh, this is, is exactly, it looks like a screen pass to Cooper Cup. If you lined Allen Robinson out in Cooper Cup's position out there, or uh, another Higby or another receiver out there, that play is not made because it's not been on film. So the lack of, creativity and the too predictableness of the Rams offense has been a downfall this year. And I can't believe I'm, I got to say it again, because I cannot believe I'm saying that about a Sean McVay offense, the whiz kid, the new kid on the block, his offense is lacking creativity and it's too predictable. Another stat to points that Cooper cup has 54 targets through four games, 54 second on that list. Higby at 36 next. Allen Robinson at 18. And number four, Ben uh, Skoranek, if I'm saying his last name right. Skoranek. Skoranek, thank you. 16 targets. Allen Robinson has two more targets than Ben. Moving on to the third reason why this Rams, is, Rams team is not performing well. The run game. Zero. No run game. Their run game is ranked 30th in the NFL. 68 and a half yards per game. They've showed up against weaker competition, again, against Arizona, Atlanta, but have been shut down against the 49ers and the Bills. They were non-existent. And then fourth on that list is the defense. This Rams defense that I hyped up so much, they added Bobby Wagner. I was so hyped about that move. Now they've got a, 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 a game changer on every level of the field. They look at Aaron Donald, Bobby Wagner, Jalen Ramsey. That's what I was praising. I said, you don't need a bunch of good players at every position, even though that would be great. If you've got a great player at each level of the defense, you're doing great because they can change the game. They have not. And let me, let me show you why. The Rams pass defense ranks 20th this season, 20th. They are behind the Houston Texans. Let that sink in. The Texans. 16th overall in yards allowed, the Rams' defense is. They have seven sacks so far. Seven. With people who are comparing Aaron Donald to Lawrence Taylor. People are comparing and saying Aaron Donald is the best defensive player to ever live. John has stated, I believe, that Aaron Donald is the best player in football, if I'm not mistaken. He has said that. This season, he said that. Seven sacks in four games. They are bottom 10 in that. They are allowing a 91.5 passer rating to their opposing quarterbacks. That ranks 18th, and they rank 22nd in completion percentage, allowing a 67.6% .6 completion percentage to their opposing quarterbacks. This Rams team is in shambles, and it needs to be fixed. Get Allen Robinson involved. The O-line, I don't know how you can fix that on the fly this season. I mean, there's nobody to really add. Maybe they should have went and looked at a Jason Peters that now the Cowboys, what a move that was. I mean, he wouldn't have been able to play left tackle. He's playing left guard in, um, in Dallas now because he, the, the feet are just not quick enough anymore at 40, 40 or 41 years of age. I don't know how that can be fixed right now 
midseason. Maybe it's just more chemistry together. The, the lack of creativity and too predictableness, that can be fixed. Sean McVay, what, what are we doing? I remember this guy giving a quote that he literally, I don't know if he still does it, but a couple of years ago when I think Wade Phillips was coaching his defense, he would literally during defensive uh, drives where his defense is on the field, go sit with this quarterback and write the, write the plays that they were going to do for the next drive. What is that happening now? What, what is going on right now? What are we doing? Sean McVay. Like, and I will put a little bit blame on Matthew Stafford because I, I heard Stephen A say this and he makes a valid point. Stafford is a what 13 or 14 year veteran in this league. He's got some cachet. He just won a Super Bowl for this team. He should be able to go up to Sean McVay and be like, yo, we got to get this guy, Allen Robinson, involved. Now, I don't know if there's because we don't know we're not in the LA Rams practice. We don't know if something's going on in practice that Sean McVay is seeing or Matthew Stafford is seeing with Allen Robinson that they're just like, like Kenny Galladay. Maybe the, Brian Dayball is definitely seeing something in practice that he's just like, I'm not even going to put you on the field because I don't see it in practice. Maybe that's the same thing with Allen Robinson. I don't know, but it needs to be fixed. You're paying this guy, what, $14, 15000000 million? The Robert Woods trade looks like a terrible trade now because you should have kept him. Him and Stafford had a pretty good connection through those couple first weeks last year. Odell is not going to be ready until what? Mid-November, maybe? Maybe? That, that needs to be fixed. The run game, Henderson, Akers, they're playing better against worse competition, but they need to start getting better. And that's also with the O-line. So the, And the defense, it's just Aaron Donald, I mean, you, you came back, you basically said you were going to retire, and then they made you the highest play, paid defensive player in the NFL or in NFL history, if I'm not mistaken. And, and, and you've done what? You've done what? And then, and then not even to blame him because he's probably getting doubled and triple teamed. Leonard Floyd, what are we doing? What are we doing? And, and I agree with John now that he said before the season, I, I attributed Von Miller's resurgence to Aaron Donald. And I still think that had some to do with it, but Von Miller has done very well in the Bills, on the Bills this season. And maybe it was just that he needed to change the scenery in Denver. And he, it, it just looks like the move they made to get Allen Robinson is looking like one of those moves that completely fell this team apart because you didn't have the money to pay Von Miller and you got rid of Robert, Robert Woods. Two people that you probably should have kept. It's not looking good. I'm still going to pick the Rams this week, though. I think they can get it together. I still think they can win the division over the 49ers. They just got to string, string together a couple of uh, couple of good games, and they'll be all right. And, and I do have to say, they were off to a bad start last season, uh, in the beginning of the season. So maybe it's something like that, and we'll see them start clicking in a, a week or two and whatever, and then they're going to be off to the races. But there are some concerns in L.A. for me. You know, you said uh, that the Rams have been playing better against uh, worse opponents, but not by much. You know, they're not, not by much. They're still – the games that they have won are one-score games, almost losing to Marcus Mariota and the Falcons. And the Arizona Cardinals actually put up a fight against them. So, I don't know how good this Rams team is, but through four weeks, they, they do not look like the Super Bowl champions that we saw last year. So, with that being said – I'm rolling with the Cowboys this week. I think uh, they're pretty much just rolling here. Three and one is the best start that they could have ever imagined after losing Dak. They, I think they would have been happy if they went into Dak's return two and three. I think they would have been satisfied with that. But right now they're sitting at three and one. They have a big game against LA, but Cooper Rush is game managing the, the hell out of these games. He's playing well. He's not, he's not, he doesn't need to throw for 300 yards. But one thing that we have, hasn't been mentioned is Michael Gallup is back, too, in that offense. So the Cowboys have a lot to look forward to, a lot to look forward to. Zeke still isn't, you know, running the way we'd, we'd love to see him, but they, we, we can't argue. They still have a, a solid rushing attack with Zeke and Pollard. Their receivers are stepping up on all, on all ends of the field now, and their defense is top three in the league. Top three. I'd go that far. And – I, I don't know. Maybe I'd argue that this Cowboys defense is better than the 49ers defense the Rams just went up against last week. 
or on par. Okay. So a couple of things. Bryn, pronounce it with me. Tala. Tala. Noah. Noah. Who? Who? Fawn. Fawn. Ga. Ga. Tala Noah Ufanga. Tala Noah Ufanga. Over. Over. Reaction. Reaction? Yep. What? I heard you sing the Rams' praises before the season started. The mm-hmm. full nine yards about the star power. And four weeks in, you're already bailing ship. No. Almost. Damn near. I-, I picked them to win this week. I know. But the way you're talking about them, it sounds like, you know, the the scale, you're going like on a seesaw effect. The Rams this year, they've played the two best defenses in the NFL. So when you said the Cowboys got the third best defense, I'm saying to myself, they're close, but that 49ers group last week, Talanoa Yufanga, Nick Bosa, and the entire unit as a whole with an amazing defensive coordinator replacing Robert Sala, that's a scary team. And the Bills are the second best defense in football right now. For this Rams group, it's pretty simple. Like, they can't protect Matthew Stafford, and that's the biggest issue. It takes time to build chemistry on the offensive line. And for a guy, Matthew Stafford, who's you know not the most mobile, he's already got 16 sacks to his name this year. And the amount of quarterback hits he's taking at 34 is far too many. Allen Robinson, sure, $31 million guaranteed. And Tyler Higby's played a larger role in this offense. Allen Robinson's been even worse than he was last year in Chicago, playing with who was it? Justin Fields and uh, was it Andy Dalton? I just got to say, it's at the end of the day, you shouldn't be panicking on the Rams that much because they still are a top 10 team in football. But at the end of the day, this Cowboys group is clicking on both ends, and it's a testament to their coaching and a word that you know the Rams may not know too much of. It's called depth and uh, good drafting. So, John, uh, I'm I'm. I'm not completely out. I literally just ended my argument by saying that I still have them winning the division. um, And I still have belief in in this team. Like, and I'm picking them to win. That's not a testament to how good they are because you talk at volume about how the 49ers are missing the playoffs. That was your prediction before the season. Yeah, yeah. So that's not that impressive, clearly, if they're going to win the division and and the 49ers aren't a playoff team, right? That doesn't mean anything. They're still picking them to win the division, though. I'm just saying you had five. And you guys had the 49ers as a top five team in the NFL. You had a laundry. I'm not talking about us. You had a laundry That's list of issues with this group, with this this Rams group. So you're clearly you're you're bailing on them. I'm not bailing. Three, I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you that there are concerns for this team, just like there's concerns for every team. I'm just listing you the concerns that I'm saying are in order right now that need to be fixed, and some of them can. The lack of creativity can be fixed. Being too predictable can be fixed. The run game can be uh, adjusted. The, the defense can play better. Those yeah. are things. The O line is going to come with time. Like you said, chemistry needs to be created over time. That cannot be rushed. But the other things can be fixed. They need to be fixed. And Clearly I. They I, need to be fixed. Obviously, they need to be fixed. I just think that they, they, they need to. I'm just telling you the concerns I have. And I'm telling you that an Allen Robinson move was probably one of the worst moves that they could have made because they lost out on a Von Miller and they traded away Robert Woods when they never should have done it either. I just think they lost Von in the first place. That's not the point. The, this they team have 13 has an uphill battle. Weeks. Uh, 13 more weeks. Sorry, you had, keep, keep you going. Bad? Yeah, I was going to say uh, they got the Cowboys this week, a week off against the Panthers, and then uh, 49ers and the Bucks. Can, this team could be three and five in a few weeks. And Stafford's been complaining his passes at an elite level, 71% with six interceptions. So the ball's not really hitting the turf too much when he's throwing it this year. It's just that he's leading the league in picks because of how much he's been under duress. I had the Cowboys as well winning this football game. I'm expecting, look, that front seven, it is sketchy. The secondary outside of Jalen Ramsey, you just go to the opposite side, much like the 49ers mm-hmm. did last week with Debo. Jimmy Garoppolo beat them convincingly. It was a blowout. I have a lot of faith. Cooper Rush is going to have a solid performance. And this may sound crazy. What is the gap between Dak Prescott and, and Cooper Rush? It's still, I mean, Cooper Rush is a backup quarterback. Dak is top 15. 
the Dak Dak is a M- MVP candidate, offensive player of the year kind of quarterback. Cooper Rush isn't that. Are so, you trying to throw up the QB controversy in Dallas? Like, are you are you basically he's trying? Sort of- if Cooper – John, let me ask you this. If Cooper Rush beats the L.A. Rams this Sunday in L.A., is there a QB controversy? No, because of how much right. they're paying Dak. Oh, so so let's take away the money then. If he goes into L.A. and beats the Rams, take the money out, is there a QB controversy in Dallas? Damn near. <laughs> and it sounds ridiculous to you, but – Cooper Rush has not lost a start yet. He's been doing a great job in this offense. And when you look at how bad the offense was in week one against the Buccaneers, look, if Dak is an MVP level quarterback, then how could Patrick Mahomes, an MVP caliber quarterback, hunt up 31 points? Because that the Buccaneers happens defense? every defense. Go back to the 01 Ravens. Go back to the 2013 Seahawks. Go back to the 02 Buccaneers. Whatever defense you want to go back to, they've all had an aberration of a, of a game. It happens to the Bucs. Let me ask you this. Has Cooper Rush ever been down more than one score over his first four starts? No. So you're telling me, let's say the Rams go out there. Let's say there's a mistake that happens on the opening drive for the Cowboys. Rams get a short field score touchdown. The, the uh, Cowboys go three and out. Rams drive down, score a touchdown. Now it's 14 zip. You can't keep handing the ball to Pollard and Elliott anymore. Guess what? Cooper Rush, it, it's on his arm now. Can he feed CD the ball enough? Can he feed Gallup? Is Gallup healthy enough right now? Dalton Schultz, didn't he just miss a game last week or the week before? I've been saying the praise of the whole. I told you guys before the season about Dallas, and I still have them winning the division in the NFC East. Look at the O-line. What did I tell you? I had no concern about that O-line because look at how well Dallas has drafted on the O-line part for the past decade plus, starting with Tyron Smith back in, what, 2011? And look how they've done since. So I said, Tyler Smith, while I don't know much about him, I'm going to lean on Stephen Jones and Jerry Jones and their scouting department that they've done a well enough job. And God damn it, guess what? They've done a well enough job. Tyler Smith has looked very good at the left tackle position. Picking up Jason Peters and plugging him in at left guard, he's done an incredible job so far. Zach Martin, still one of the top guards in the league or top offensive linemen out there. This offensive line is very good, but Cooper Rush, if you're forced to pass it, we don't know what he can be, and we've got to see that. Okay, if, so if he gets I got a question. Down, look, go ahead, John. Justin, sorry. You got two weeks. Uh, you got the Rams and the Eagles. Mm-hmm. When do you decide to bring Dak Prescott back? Well, there, this is what we've got to decide first. Is, is Jerry Jones being coy? Is he lying to us by saying Dak Prescott can't grip the, grip the football? Or is he telling the truth when he says that? I should at least note, Dak has been rolled out versus the Rams for anyone that does not know. He yes. Not yes. Oh, yeah, no, he's not going to be here. This I'm saying, would you bring him back next week against the Eagles if he's available? No, I wouldn't. No? The reason why I asked that question, guys, is because Cooper Rush, he is just being thrown into the lineup. And much like Dak Prescott his first season, he's just getting the job done. And he's been a great backup at that. Mm-hmm. Dak Prescott, he's a middling quarterback. Keep going. I said to myself, there is a gap between those two players, but Dak is not the guy his 306 passing yards per game would suggest. He is not a top 10 guy. He's not top 12. Is he top 14? I'm not quite sure because he's had everything around him. And how many playoff games has he won? At the end of the day, the Cowboys have had phenomenal. Has he had everything years. around him? Outside of the defense. Has he had a quality coach ever? Ever. Kellen, Kellen Morris, the play caller, and he's, he's an offensive doing coordinator. Good job said head right coach. now with Cooper head Rush. Coach. Darn said head good coach. job. I said head coach. Yeah, I mean, Dak plays a role in the lack of time management skills as well. We saw last yeah, year versus the 49ers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that. Dak's oh. fine. I think he's a middling quarterback. I think he's like 14th, 15th in the league. And Cooper Rush, much like Tyler Huntley, Huntley last year, showing for how young he is, this is one of the top guys you can go to. And not have to worry about losing games. No turnovers. Two game winning drives. I think he's basically solidified that backup spot much better than Ben DiNucci and uh, Garrett Gilbert. I think Dak Prescott's a little bit underrated there. I, I feel like you're being a, a little disrespectful to a guy mm-hmm. that almost threw for 5,000 yards not too long ago. And then last mm-hmm. season put up great numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some, there's some bonehead moves that you see. I get that. But Dak Prescott is an elite quarterback. 
This is a, no, he's not an elite not quarterback. Elite. That's too. That's he's, too far. No, no, no. Elite, he's elite, elite, he's elite is top fantasy 10. quarterback. Elite okay, is, fine. Justin, I guess so. But Justin, elite is like top ten. Like you're not. He's he's not a top ten quarterback. Should he is we top go 15. over our top tens again and see? I'm taking Kyler if we're, over. If him. we're, you're taking Kyler over him. Hell yeah. I made a mistake sleeping on Dak in my top ten, and the more oh. I think about it, I I, I smack myself oh. in the head. I had Derek Carr in ten. Yeah, well, that was your fun. That was your blunder. I, I just got to remind John that this is a guy Dak Prescott in his rookie season after being a fourth round pick went toe to toe with Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. in like a shootout game and was this was a insanely one of the greatest throws you'll ever see. Aaron Rodgers to Jared Cook Jr. and two Mason Crosby insane field goals that hooked and hit the crossbar or whatever the hell away from beating Green Bay in the in the playoffs. So. Cooper Rush, he's a fine backup. He's doing a good job, but he hasn't been down. He hasn't been asked to do a lot. We'll see over the I, – I wouldn't bring Dak Prescott back next week because I just think you would set him up perfectly if you were to bring him back against the Detroit Lions in a 1 o'clock game that nobody's really going to uh, worry about that much. And look how bad the Detroit defense has looked this season. It's god-awful. The worst. Probably. Yeah, yeah, don't bring in – don't bring in, um, don't bring him back for the Eagles game where the Eagles might be starting off five and zero. And Sunday night, it's a big game. I, that's not smart for Dak, but I hope to God there's no QB controversy because that's just insane to me. I, I just I don't see it. Well, when the Cowboys win this week, there will be one. I got the Cowboys taking this one, no. twenty to seventeen. This mm-hmm. episode is brought to you by our partners and good friends at BetStamp for somebody. That is new to sports betting. I started using BetStamp a few months ago, and the biggest perk is it allows you to see all sports books in one single place. When you're putting your money on the line, trying to maximize your profits, the most important thing is making sure you're going to get the best return. You want to know what the best odds are, but for most of us, we don't have the storage base, the time to download a variety of different sports books apps, and you may realize you're not even going to use the specific one. What BetStamp allows you to do when you sign up and create an account is see it all in one place to get the entire nine yards in one specific place and honestly too considering the fact it's free you have nothing to lose try the bet stamp app for yourself and be sure to let them know who sent you at the wise guys that is w-i-s-e-g-u-y-s wise guys speaking of the picks this week my Steelers are like 14 and a half point underdogs uh, it's insane but talking about the other team and yeah it's it's rough and honestly it could be a even bigger beating depending on how that game pans out Talking about the other team in Pennsylvania, which has not been massively underwhelming, the Eagles have been clicking on all cylinders this year. Jalen Hurts is the MVP candidate. Some people thought could be. A.J. Brown is an absolute monster. And that defense as a whole, the secondary is ridiculous. The front seven, it's a scary group. Now you have the Cardinals coming to Cliff Kingsbury, who he hasn't done a very good job the last three years, and he needs to step things up because... You may have Kyler Murray, a top 10 quarterback, and you start the year 2-2, two and two, and you probably should be at least 3-1. and one. It does put you on the hot seat for sure. Brandon, what do you have this week between the two birds? Yeah, I was going to say it's the battle of the birds this week. Um, I don't see how you can have Arizona. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be quick and simple because I just – Arizona's defense is garbage. Philly's offense is clicking on all the cylinders right now. Um. So yeah, just give me Philly five and zero headed to it. Um, yeah, I just don't really see. I, I mean, it, it could be a close game if Arizona's offense shows up, but Philly's defense is playing at a really high level. Eh, yeah, Philly five and zero, probably what twenty seven to twenty. I'll give it twenty seven to twenty. All right, Eagles. You know, it's funny uh, with Jalen Hurts and and Kyler Murray. You kind of put them in the same category because of their style of plays. And I think Arizona w- was hoping for this kind of impact that Jalen Hurts is having on the Philly offense. And right now, Arizona does not look like a very good football team. I'm going to roll with Philly. And my shout out is to Miles Sanders because, man, that guy wasn't finding the end zone for nothing last season. And last week went absolutely bonkers 27 rushes, 134 yards, and two touchdowns. Thank you, Miles, from my fantasy team. My heart to yours. Uh, So I'm rolling with Philly. I think they're legit, man. This team, you know, going into the season, you're skeptical on what their ceiling is. 
But I honestly think this is a team that could contend with the big bad boys in the NFC. Right now, Philadelphia is the best team in the NFC. And though the Cardinals are home, there's something about this Eagles group this year where it's not fluky whatsoever. And Jalen Hurts, when it comes to leading a group, if the Cardinals find themselves with a lead in this game, I have way more faith in Philadelphia coming back. And at the end of the day, quarterback, coach, defense, weapons, the Eagles have all of those things tilted in their favor. Even if it's not by much on paper, the Cardinals have a great offense. That defense as well. They got a good week behind them playing against Baker Mayfield, but that was just a get-right week. They're going to be snapped back into reality against one of the most dynamic offenses and rushing attacks in the entire league. Because I got the Eagles winning this one 29-17. to John, did you agree? I didn't get my score. Let me get my score. Yeah, I got 34 to 20. Eagles. Yeah. John, did you hear my comparison that I compared this Philadelphia Eagles team to the Tim Tebow Broncos? Yeah, I had to put that on TikTok. That was ridiculous. Nah, I thought it was disrespectful. No, it's not. Nick Sirianni versus. Uh, who was their coach? Not, Fox? I'm, not, I'm not comparing that. I'm just saying, John look Fox. at the way that they play play the game. It's very led on a running attack with your uh, running backs and your running quarterback, doing a lot of RPOs, doing a lot of read options and stuff like that. And and you have the two weapons on the outside: Eric Decker, Demarius Thomas, AJ Brown, Devonta Smith. It, it's it's very similar. O line is very no, good. It's, it's not playing. very well, similar yes, because is. Demarius Thomas had 500 yards in his second season. A.J. Brown is the top seven receiver in the NFL. Eric Decker did not break out until he got Peyton Manning. You, you saw Smith right now is breaking out. You, you saw you saw you saw up close and personal what Demarius Thomas is capable of. You really didn't get a whole lot of it because he was not the most productive guy. And he became a phenomenal a couple of seasons later. When Game one and touchdown. That was one play. I did say. You just, you it's just wanted, play. To, one you play. Just wanted, you wanted just to throw it. that out there no, just no, no, to, no. to crap just on John. One play, gonna, it was the, the play. I, I'm going to come to John's defense because now you're just doing that to clown the Steelers. But I'm the facts, the facts, I'm not, the facts it are, happened. I'm not clowning them. It but happened. the facts are the facts. The facts Tim, are the facts. A Tim Tebow-led Broncos team does not compare at all. To yeah, what this Eagles bro, team is. You're a fool for saying that. You know how many that yards Broncos team, both... he threw for 1,700 yards. That Broncos team had 2,700 passing yeah. yards. Do you know how many? Yards. You know how many yards he threw against your Pittsburgh Steelers in that playoff game? Yes, 316. Yeah, 316. Jalen Hurts threw four games, has 1,100. All right, only 300, and that's not even including his rushing. So okay. that's a terrible comparison. It's not. They play a very similar style of football. They don't really because yes, they do. Dynamic, the oh, Eagles' okay. weapons completely change the game. AJ Brown right now is basically a top five guy in his position. They're massively different, especially when you talk about throwing the football. They don't. They're, they're not even on they're, the same level. They don't compete. With they that. do. They they're, do. They're, they're you're really you're telling me Tim Tebow throwing the football is just as as the same as Jalen Hurts? I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that their style of football is very similar that they play. That's what I'm saying. But Tim, too. Okay, Tim yeah, all right, let's, do, let's, let's do this. This current Steelers team, its style of play is just like the 70s Steelers. The same thing. They're basically the same team. They might no, they're play. not. What are you talking about? They play the same way. Play the same way it's the 74 and 73 Steelers. There's no difference between them. Game manager at quarterback, dynamic weapons, and an elite defense led by a defensive player of the year. There's no difference. Literally, You guys don't team. have an elite defense this year. What are you talking about? Well, that's, yeah. that's how we're built. That's our style. Yeah, that's but you don't. You're not doing it though. The Denver Broncos did that. that the Broncos Eagles are doing they that. They didn't start four and zero. How many games did he win when he took over? He played. He had a positive record. Okay, you're right. But here's the thing: who was the star of the offense? Tim Tebow. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Tim Tebow made plays in the fourth quarter. He was the, For the star. The first though. three quarters. Who was their primary player? Who who, who changed who, 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 the – you're going to say no Sean Marino. You're probably going to say no, no Sean Marino. No, it was Willis, Willis McGahee. McGahee. Okay, well, Willis sorry. Willis McGahee that, that was, a couple was years the ago. man back then. All right. But, yeah, but he, what was he doing when Kyle Orton was the starting quarterback? He wasn't performing like Tebow because Tebow completely changed the offense and became the number one rushing attack in the NFL. Bro, you're talking to somebody that – I love Tim Tebow. I don't want to slander him, but you comparing him – to Jalen Hurts? I didn't nuts. compare them. I said their offenses 
Denver and this Philly team play a similar style of offense, and that is a true statement. But no, they don't. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, they really don't. Okay. Did okay. you? I, I'm sorry. If I it's very back, similar, if, bro. If Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz is in the game. Carson Wentz is in the game. The offense is not clicking. They put in Jalen Hurts. He presides it. He he gives a complete injection spark to this team. The offense completely changes. Yeah. Same thing, Tebow or in to Tebow. Did you see that that Broncos team was not making plays the way that they were the other week against Washington? They, they, nobody was jumping over to the defenders game. making catches or he throwing the ball them. down the sideline like that. No. Okay. No. All I know is Tim Tebow got the job done. And You're right. Buddy, he did. And he, I'm happy he maybe did. Maybe you don't realize this. The reason the Broncos won eight games that season was not because of their offense. It was because defensively they had, I don't know, a rookie Von Miller, Elvis <laughs> Dumeril, yeah. Elvis Dumerville, excuse Again. me, Brian Dawkins and Champ Bailey. That's how they won Again. football games. That's Again. how they were able to limit well, the Steelers. They were a running, games. a running offense, and then they played great defense. That's how they won games. Don't just disrespect. They didn't win the games. Offense. They were nine and nine that season. They were not a winning team. That was. We're talking about they went nine to the playoffs and nine losses. They're they five to the playoffs. You can't they go nine a, and nine. They beat a Steelers team that regressed and was not particularly good. Wait, d- nine and nine is an impossible record in, in a season. Eight and eight, and then they went one and one in the playoffs. Oh, okay. That's what you're bringing up. Okay. Yep. The, but Tebow was a positive record. You're bringing up the Kyle Orton losses in the earlier season. Tebow took over and was had a positive record. Yes, he did. I think they went, was it seven and three under Tebow? Something like that. I, I could be wrong. But regardless, all right, you guys are just getting up in arms about this. I mean, a simple comparison. Seven, you're acting like, oh my yeah, god, you just not a good, it's not, it wasn't a good. You just compared Tom Brady to Tim Tebow. No, Tim Tebow Jaylen completed forty-seven. Forty-seven percent of his passes were completed. Jalen Hurts right now is almost at seventy percent. Yeah, that the, the offense isn't the same. The offense is so much better. It's very similar. So much better. Thirty percent higher completions. That, I mean, yeah. Moving on, uh, that was maybe the most bizarre. Topic all he I did was win games, be. though. By the way, John, your light is very bright. I know. Change? It's so hot. It's really frustrating. Oh. So, uh, in the meantime, Sunday night football, AC North. Bengals are going to Baltimore to face off with Lamar Jackson. Joe Burrow has just not been himself this year. Zach Taylor's play calling is very poor. But at the end of the day, they have Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, who is basically like a a, a, a swing man playing the two. Um, he, he's insane. And Tyler Boyd with Joe Mixon. Bengals are two and two. Ravens are two and two. Justin, who was taking this game on Sunday night? Ravens have had some colossal losses at home right now. And this is a tough one. So they're they're back on their home turf. Sunday night football, all eyes on them. Uh, Jamar Chase torched them a couple times last season. Uh, this is a tough one, especially with the way their defense has been playing. Uh, I think I... I I don't want to do it because I'm so high on the Ravens this year, and I still have them winning the North, but this week I think I'm going to have to roll with the Bengals. I absolutely have to. I think uh, they'll click. I think the Bengals have been just waiting for the right game. This is the time to show it. I told you guys that the game against the Jets wasn't their uh, coming out party, but they go out there, they beat the they beat the Dolphins at home. Now I actually think that something is rolling. They got something here. They got the ball rolling here, and – I could see them going into Baltimore. This is a big game, a big prove-it game for the former AFC champions, and I think they come out with the W. I'll go 27-23. Bengals. Who told y'all? Who told y'all? Who told y'all that that Jets game was a confidence-building game? It wasn't a confidence-builder. I didn't say that. It was the the Dolphins one that definitely – They just kind of went rolling. You know, beat Miami that everybody was like, oh, my God, look at Tua. Look at him. Oh, look at him. And Tua was hurt. Yeah, now he's hurt. Yep. Um. So, this game in Baltimore, and like Justin said, the Ravens have played really trash at, at home. They're 0-2 in Baltimore this year. Um, the Bengals are 2-0 and in the last two weeks. Burrow has zero turnovers in the last two weeks. The O-line, O-line has only allowed three sacks in the last two weeks. And the, the, the matchup between Burrow and Lamar, it's a 2-1 and head-to-head record. Uh, Burrow leads it. And all of the games are by blowouts. So last two games were last year, obviously, where the Ravens secondary was the worst in the NFL. And um, Burrow just blew them out. And then they played in Burrow's rookie season. And the Ravens won, I think, 21 to 3 or something like that. Baltimore is favored by three points. 
Um, Burroughs played really good the last two weeks. The whole team is is starting to click. I picked them to win this division. They were my number one team in the AFC before the season started. I'm going to roll with uh, the Bengals. Uh, yeah, I just I think that the Ravens are mortally flawed, and it's just not good. Like when you give up those type of comebacks, a, a 28 to seven lead in the fourth quarter to Miami. And then you have a 17 to three lead, if I'm not mistaken, against the Buffalo Bills or a 20 to three lead against the Buffalo Bills. Excuse me. I, I, I just think that this team is insanely flawed and they have a chance to literally blow up and implode at any given point after what we just saw. So I'm going to take the Bengals in this one. Uh, I think they're offensive weapons are going to go off against the second. I mean, Marlon Humphreys has been playing very good, but the rest of the secondary as a unit is just not playing well. Minus their last week game against the Bills where they actually played very well against Josh Allen. They haven't played well for the last 19, 20 games. So give me the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, I'll say, I don't think this one's going to be a blowout. I think this is going to be their first close game. I'll say 30 to 25 Bengals. You know, I, I just wanted to do some research uh, before you go, John. Last last year, the Bengals swept Baltimore. In their first game that they went up against each other, they won 41 to 17. Jamar Chase had eight receptions for 201 yards and a touchdown. In the second game, uh, Bengals dropped another 41 nugget on their heads, won 41 to 21. Jamar Chase, seven receptions for 125. So it seems like the Bengals had their number last year. We'll see if that continues on Sunday night. The What's secondary that? was insanely ravaged with injuries last year, though. That's so. true. That's true. But they still aren't looking great this year. No. Go ahead, Johnny boy. The Ravens are favorites at minus three. But, Brandon, I don't get your vendetta against this Baltimore secondary because it's not been the problem. It just hasn't been. It's a symptom of a pass rush that is not good. It's the strangest thing. Marcus Williams is playing at damn near like an all-pro, at least Pro Bowl level. Marlon Humphrey's getting right. He's one of the top corners in the league. Marcus Peters, he's also getting right off of his torn ACL. It's one of the best secondaries, and if it hasn't already established itself as one, it will be by year's end. For the Ravens, they've been the best first quarter team in the league this year, and Against this Bengals group, I have them winning this one 23-21. to 21. I think we're going to see a lot of close games this week. It's the part of the season where teams are starting to feel the bumps and the bruises. It's going to get tougher. It's going to get uglier. But this Baltimore rushing attack with J.K. Dobbins being healthy for a second straight week, Gus, not Gus, Will, not Gus Edwards is not playing, but Justice Hill is doubtful for this game. I do think Rashad Bateman as well is again right in practice, or he was absent in practice, excuse me. Gus Williams was able to return to practice. I think they're starting to get a little bit more healthy. They're getting a little bit more juice, a little bit more depth as well. So I think they will have the nod in this one. Lamar Jackson, he's going to get right back on track of his MVP tour. The Ravens are going to start off the ring, too. I don't have a vendetta against the Baltimore Ravens secondary, John. It's just that they've played absolutely garbage for the past 20 games. So, And I did highlight that Marlon Humphreys, as an individual talent, is playing very well this season. And like you've said, Marcus Williams is playing very well, but as a unit, they are not playing well. You know, and you maybe, can point to that. You maybe, can point Brandon, to the pass that's, rush. That is a fair point. That's a fair point. That might be what happens when your top two players on defense tear their ACL before the yeah, season even gets I, to the midway I, point. I said that. And your pass rush is not there. David Ajabo probably cannot recover from his torn Achilles faster. I, I I brought up the fact that they were ravaged with injuries last year. I, I said that. But that's, that's the reason why. Okay. You're evaluating a group that, yeah, it was terrible because they had terrible injury. But, they're sti- but that, that's not going to change throughout the season, though. That they're, they're still going to be recovering from those injuries. But they're at least like, back out there in the field. So yes, they are. Silence, nursing that. But they're still not performing. Look at the Baltimore. Look, look at the freaking Dolphins game. It's week five. Not even. Oh, my answer. God. You can't. You're not allowed to use that excuse when at over week one, you were overreacting to a bunch of teams. You can't use that excuse on me. No, that doesn't work. Unbelievable. Because I that, that that's what I you say. Won't even you give them the mid season to get back on track. What are you talking? All right, if they prove me wrong, then they prove me wrong. But I'm saying if their ACLs are still recovering, or uh, yeah, ACLs are still recovering, 
that's still going to be there throughout this whole season. Now, if they get it back together through the end of the season, I will be the first one to sit up here and say they got it together. But right now, currently, as we sit, but what have they shown me to say they've gotten it together besides the Buffalo game where they played a very good game against Josh Allen in the passing game uh, attack? Marcus Williams leading the league in picks. All right, but when you blow how those two games, 28 to 7 in the fourth quarter, they allowed how many points in the fourth quarter? They were playing against two. Tua Tonga Vailoa. Tyreek Hill with rookies out there and Jalen Waddle. Okay. It's basically impossible to stop Tyreek Hill. Yeah. And when you're well, the Buffalo out, Bills like, just did, did they not? What do you have, like two catches for 33 yards or something? It is the second best defense in football. Yeah. Oh, second best. You but you're over here singing the praises of the Ravens defense that they can play very good, that they have I'm one sure of the best is. secondaries in the league. Talent wise, they do. I agree with you. Talent wise, the best indicator of future performance is past performance. Marlon Humphrey's been all pro corner. Marcus Peters has been all pro corner. And Marcus Williams playing an elite level right now. Okay. Okay. I and hope that they get it back together. I hope so, because right now they're disrespecting the Ravens' legacy. When you're evaluating Jalen Armour Davis and Kyle Hamilton, their second NFL starts, and say, oh, the secondary is cruddy, it, it's not really a fail. Uh, hey, John, can I ask you a question? Is their pass rush going to get any better this year? No. Okay, then I don't – how are you going to make that? They did that in Jason Pierre-Paul. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you just said they're not. So if the pass rush isn't going to get better – we all know how it works. If your pass rush ain't getting it and you're giving that quarterback three, four, five seconds, which is an eternity in the in NFL, the secondary can only cover for so long. That's very true. Yeah. Very true. But, you know, we'll see now, what happens throughout the season. Ronnie Stanley is getting closer and closer to him, his return. I don't think Colby really <laughs> say this every week. He's, he's closer and closer. Back to back practices for the first time. <laughs> He's very close, according to ESPN's reports. With all that out of the way, we're going to be taking a deep dive into our NFL Week 5 pick em. Last week, boys, oof, wasn't a great week for our boy B-Cap. He was, what, 7? He had 6 points. I had 11. Justin had 11. I'm in, yeah, I'm in, I'm in third place. Right? John is killing it right now with 37 and 26. Justin is 33 and 30, and I'm 30 and 33 overall. I wish we started this sooner so we can get subscribers in as well. Next year, when we start off the Patreon, that's going to be a benefit. We're going to have people join us for a fantasy football league or a pick em. Now, this week, it's not the best slate of games the way it was week one or week two. Starting off, we already covered the Colts versus the Broncos. We got the Giants versus the Packers. Steelers versus Bills. This one is expected to be a blowout. And the line... Minus 14. Oh. What is that? Like the biggest... I think that's their most points they've been... They've been underdogs in their entire history as a Steelers team. I think I saw that. In a long time. Yeah. And it's in Buffalo. Yeah, Buffalo's going to win. I'm sorry, John. Hopefully Kenny Pickett can show you a couple flashes here and there to give you at least a silver lining for the future. But it, it's not your week this week. Kenny Pickett brought energy last week. This offense has lacked in a long time. But they're still 0-7. and zero. They haven't won with TJ Watt. And that's not going to change on the road with a rookie quarterback making his first start. So give me the bills. And honestly, this one could be a close game, but it could also be an absolute shell shock of a disaster. Hey, right. I'm rolling with Buffalo. Uh, another yeah. beat down. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. All right. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Next up, Browns versus Chargers. Before the season, I had the Browns winning this game. It's the type of match where the Chargers, they've been killed by injuries. They always have these weird, sluggish weeks like we saw when they got killed by four touchdowns against Jacksonville. Give me Jacoby Brissett. I just don't feel great about this Chargers group, and I expect Cleveland to start 3-2. and two. Yeah, I'm with you, John. I'm rolling with Cleveland this week. I think they, they've had some games where, I mean, they could have won just last week too. I, I think they're better than what people expect them to be. And they're just waiting for that Deshaun Watson return. They start this one with a win. Yeah, I mean, it's in Cleveland. Uh, I'll agree with you guys. I'll take that Cleveland uh, running game. Uh, it's just this Chargers team has been ravished with injuries. Justin Herbert's still not healthy. J.C. Jackson is just coming back. Um, Rashawn Slater's out for the season, or he's just on IR. But he's be up. Yeah. So 
and Joey Bosa's out. It, yeah, it's not looking good for these Chargers. So give me Cleveland. That's, I mean, two and three to start the season, not good for the Chargers. Definitely not great. Another team that's not great is the two and two Chicago Bears, who are seven point underdogs going to Minnesota at one o'clock. Look, Jettas, he's going to get right again for a second straight strong performance after that disaster on prime time. Give me the Vikings convincingly. Yeah, I'm rolling with Minnesota. Get Jet is involved early and often, and Minnesota will fly away with this one. Yeah, I mean, give me Minnesota. There's nothing more to say. Chicago's defense only allowed 19 points a game. Yeah. They'll allow 30 this week. Better not choke this one. So the most fun team in football is the Detroit Lions, and they're playing the most boring team this week in New England where they're three-point underdogs. This Lions defense is an absolute disaster, but this Patriots offense of Bailey Zappi, I don't have a lot of confidence in. Who do you guys got as Patriot fans? Oof. Man, this is tough. Uh, geez. That Lions defense is not good. Really? Geno Smith just, just put up 48 points on them. Uh, so it's tough for me to say, oh, Bailey Zappi can't do it. Um. So, you know what? I, I hate to do it, but I, I have to bet against my team this week. Um, and I'm rolling with the guys on my sweater right now, and I got to stick with the Lions. So, I will say that this running they, – they've allowed a lot of running yards. The one game is the Commanders where they didn't really allow it, but week one against the Eagles, Sanders, and um, uh, the other guy, I just forgot his name, oh, had a pretty good game. Dalvin Cook had a good game, and Rashad Penny just went absolutely off. Uh, one thing that the Patriots can do very well is run the football. We got two really good running backs. Bailey Zappi's obviously not going to be asked to do anything. I would imagine he's going to get – maybe 17 pass attempts this entire game, maybe. Um, it's going to be a heavy load. Damian Harris might get 20 carries. Uh, Manji might get like 15 or 16. So this is such a tough game. The lines are really banged up. I'm on Ross. I'm going to take DeAndre I'm, Swift in a practice. Yeah. I'm going to take New England, but in a very close game. I just think that they can control the time of possession and run all over this defense. And I think the Patriots defense can get a couple of stops. You're convincing me. I think I want to change my pick. <laughs> I think this can be an absolute shootout because wow. of what Jared Goss been able to do this year, but it won't against the Patriots. And I think they'll manage this game to victory. They almost beat Aaron Rodgers last week. Don't overthink it. I've got the pass. It's in New England too. We should not, we should uh, mention. You, you know what it is? I, I feel pressure because I'm wearing a Lions hoodie right now. So it's like, I feel oddly. Uh -oh. To pick them. oh, there you go. But I'm going to change it. Since I'm going to roll with England. We got I'm the most changing. emphatic screen freeze right there by you. You're obligated. <laughs> Your Next point up, got across, though, Justin. Your point got across. As an NFL fan growing up, there were three teams that kind of were endearing to me. The Steelers, the Saints, and the Seahawks. The Saints and the Seahawks play one another this week. And, whew. Andy Dalton, you know, he had a very solid game. You can make the case there was a quarterback controversy in New Orleans where they're five and a half point favorites versus Geno Smith. Look, I know the Seahawks have had two great wins against the Lions and the Broncos, but the Saints are going to take this victory. I hope to God they take this victory. Um, but yeah, I'm going to take the Saints. It's in New Orleans, the Superdome. Those fans get raucous. So, yeah, give, give me the Saints. Hope that defense better show up. Yeah, I'm rolling with the Saints, just hoping that Michael Thomas will be healthy. Alvin Kamara will be out there as well, hopefully. Um, as long as those two are there, I'm going to roll with the Saints. Kamara was a late scratch last week, limited participant this week in practice. Michael Thomas is still not practiced yet with that foot. Look, if the Seahawks win this game, I think the game plan is pretty simple. Let's hand off the football to Rashad Penny because it seems to work when they do. Mm -hmm. Pretty good game plan. Next up, we have the battle of the AFC East, the second and third best teams in the division in the Miami Dolphins traveling to the Meadowlands at 1 o'clock to play the Jets. The Dolphins without Tua Tagovailoa this week. He is in concussion protocol. I don't really have the take of that. that I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not a doctor. 
They're three and a half point favorites in spite of him being out. Who do you guys have? Rolling with the Jets, man. I think uh, Zach Wilson, they have some momentum there. Zach Wilson wasn't amazing throughout that whole game, but he was special when he needed to be. And I think without Tua, I think the Jets can take take advantage. We just throw the word around special, don't we? Um, I said uh, special when he needed to be. Yeah, you should. The word special and Zach oh. Wilson should never be used. Do you see the way you hit that gritty? I don't give a goddamn crap. You're just blowing up the word. Like, Congratulations. He can dance. Wow. Applaud you. Um, give me the Dolphins. I mean, you guys were singing this team's praises. And just because two is down, they have Teddy Bridgewater, who's one of the best backup quarterbacks in the league. They still have Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell. They still have Mike McDaniel, who you guys are very high on, and I am sold on. I, I don't get how you're picking the Jets. They're still the Jets. Give me the Dolphins. I have to say that, say it better. Prayers up to Tua. Um, I was like, I don't have a take. Tua, I, I wish him well. He's one of the most endearing athletes in the sport. And what happened to him on Thursday night was absolutely terrible. This week without him, Teron Armstead, their, their, their left tackle did not practice. Neither did Zaven Howard with the groin and Jalen Waddle as well with the same injury. Look, man, Zach Wilson has moxie to him. And this Dolphins offense was run differently with Teddy Bridgewater. There is a difference between those two players that I did not expect coming into the year. Give me these New York Jets. Scary offense when it's all clicking. You laughing at me? <laughs> you just said scary offense. Don't be scared of the Jets, dude. Bruce Nobody. Hall, he's questionable, but oh, man. Garrett Wilson, Elijah Moore, Ooh, Tyler I'm Tom, so scared. That is a very good offense. The offensive yeah. t- offensive line's been banged up, but I'll be honest. I, I think Brandon's just really just being disrespectful. Oh, but man. honestly, I think there's talent on this Jets team. And as a Patriots fan, as much as I hate to say it, they have way more talent on offense than us. And okay. no more wins. And, 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 and not by and I'm saying not by a little bit, by you, a whole you lot. You can of it. say you can say they have talent on the offense. I will not disagree with that. But to say the word scary and to say special is going way too Again, far. I did not call the quarterback special. I I used it in a specific sentence saying he was special when he needed to be. When he needed when they needed him to make the plays, he made the plays. So, my bad. Let me say he played well when he needed to be to make Brandon happy. Thank you. Yes, because you Jesus. shouldn't be using special anywhere near Zach Wilson's name. Buddy. He is a, ta- a hell of a talent. Okay, but he's not special. A like, special a, talent. Special. Yes, so that needs to put it all together. Before the season, where is uh, Zach Wilson right, in the NFL? To come Buster. on the road in your first game back from injury at Heinz Field and when all matters lead a 65-yard 10-play oh. drive to win, that is a special. Against a drive. defense with that has been trash this season, and you have just stated that they, have a, they are winless without. But so what? So what? This is game back from injury. It's first, exactly. First game back from injury. This is his second season, and you want to see him make, you want to see if he improved at at, at any point. And this, that Sunday, it looked like there was some change. That wasn't the Zach Wilson we saw last year, because if you input last year's Zach Wilson into this, that game, I guarantee you they lose. He had good games last year, though, but he also had an abundance of season. Crap games, though. You know what, Brent? At the end of the day, he won, and the Patriots are one and three. Moving on to our next game of the week, what Brandon is expecting to be a beatdown because I've already heard him talk at nauseum about it. The Atlanta Falcons going to Tampa Bay at one o'clock, and let me tell you, they're not favorites by any stretch. The Buccaneers are expected to win nine point favorites, minus nine and a half. Minus nine. I, re- I respect that. I'm going blow down. out, blow out Tampa. Marcus Mariota has been doing a good job, and that team can run the darn football. But no Cordell Patterson now. I, I don't feel as optimistic going into at least this week. I still like the team, but this week, uh, Tampa's looking to get rolling. Rams defense gets back on track. I mean, sorry, Rams Buccaneers defense gets back on track. Tyler Algier had a very good performance along with Caleb Huntley. Two rookies in there. I think they're still going to do a fine job. Next game, Titans get a win last week against the Colts. Would you pick? Good one. Oh, uh, Buccaneers. Cool. Okay. Um, Titans going to Washington where they're two point favorites at minus two. 
look, this commander's team is an absolute disaster. Carson Wentz is late, delayed. Uh, he's kind of a broken quarterback. Give me the Titans. Give me the Titans. I think this is a week that I could see the, the commanders pulling out a win here. So I'm going to go with Washington. I want to roll with them, but I just looking at that offense and how bad the defense has been. Chase Young is still not back. They're going to take their time with him because, I mean, he's not going to save the season, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Next game, maybe the worst team in the NFL right now, the Houston Texans going to Jacksonville where they're seven-point underdogs, minus seven at one o'clock. Give me the Jags. Man, they're going to start three and two and put themselves in prime position at first place in the AFC, AFC South. Yeah, I'm high on Jacksonville. You know how I am about Duval County, so I think T-Law picks up and they they run right over Houston. What's yeah. the saying for them? Duval! That's it. Forgot yeah, it. Yeah, give me the Jaguars in Jacksonville. Um, yeah, there's... Yeah, just go on. Next game. So if Baker Mayfield is the lowest QBR in the NFL, the second lowest in NFL history right now, this game against San Francisco's defense is going to be disgusting. Let me say this, DJ Moore, he's a wide receiver number one, and just like Deontay Johnson, who he needs an actual quarterback, and I'm taking the 49ers in this game convincingly, where they're on the road, but still six and a half point favorites, minus six and a half. Give me the Niners. Is it a question on what team I'm going with this week? Of course I'm going with San Francisco. Baker is going to continue to look ugly. You know, you know Brand's going to go with that. We're in Niners. Just... Come on, just say it. Don't waste our time. We're the Carolina Panthers. <laughs> All right. That, Why? That's just hit. You know what? What's his? What's the yeah, reasoning yeah. behind it? Just so he can get an edge in this pick'em, just in case they win. Just to get an <laughs> well, extra game. Real off. quick, Justin is going to be in uh, last place, just like the Panthers in the, in the standings. <laughs> Go right with Matt Roller, right? You guys can. Go to your seat over there, Baker. What, what's your reason? Fired. Huh? What's your reason? Doesn't I believe in Baker. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> this is the weirdest relationship I have ever seen with the quarterback. No, this the weirdest relationship absolute that you and Davis knows. I just called this team the worst in the NFL, and I said he was a great, tankastic yeah. quarterback. I'm not. I love. I love how how I love how you don't respect injuries at all. Like you basically disrespect. Hey, if you play through injuries, disrespect. I'm gonna evaluate like, you. That's how this thing works. Okay, keep that same energy. We'll see you how evaluate that. Evaluate Daniel Jones. Out, and he plays through injuries, don't you? I sure didn't evaluate. Did. He's trash regardless if he's injured or not. He's, he's garbage. He's through neck, ankle, and hamstring injuries oh, the last two years. Just like Baker. Congratulations. It's, it's the torn labrum. What it's the hell has he done? What has he well, done? The last two years, buddy, Um, they have the same amount of wins. So I would okay. calm down a little bit. And we'll, so, again, we're going to disrespect Baker and just say, oh, the injury last year, you know, fractured shoulder, torn labrum. Who cares? We're still evaluating you. Yeah, he shouldn't have played. If you're going to play when yeah. you have a contract yeah. on the line. You want to know job, something? Yeah, you want to know you. something? That's not on the player. That's on the coaching staff because you know players are going to want to play. You don't nod your head no. You know if you are a competitor and you want to go back out on that field, you're going to say whatever the hell you want. You don't think Tua was lying through that concussion test on Sunday against the Bills. You don't think he was lying when but he was going through that concussion thing. test. That's not it's different. You're here. getting injured and you want to go back out on the field because Tua, you're a player and Tua you're going is to not in a contract year though. Baker that was does, in a contract year. That, that that's irregardless of the situation I'm talking about. I'm simply talking about a player who's injured, contract or not, they are going to go want to go play because that's a player's mindset. And you should know that. You should know that because that's a fact. And the coaching staff is supposed to be there to protect you from yourself. That is why the Dolphins front office, the Dolphins coaching staff, and the medical staff of the Dolphins are being attacked, and people are calling for people's jobs, fines, suspensions, because they didn't do what was necessary to protect their quarterback, their player. Same thing for Baker. Same thing. There is no difference. And if you say there's a difference, that is exact Baker hate that I'm talking about where you're just hating on him for no reason or just because that I like him. That's it. That's the only reason you're saying that. Because there's no difference. I said it before, and no, I made a mistake. Daniel Jones has five wins last two years. Baker has seven. I thought Daniel Jones had uh, four wins last year. Not the point. But you know, Daniel Jones, did he have seven wins last year? Let's, I'll check in a minute. Not the, I know he doesn't have a playoff win in his record, so. 
Let's just move on. He also didn't have his defense hand in that win. Uh, We already covered the Cowboys versus the Rams. I had the Cowboys winning, so it's Justin. You have the Rams. Eagles versus Cardinals could be a beatdown. Bengals versus Ravens we covered. Last game, Monday night, the Oakland Raiders. Or this last, I did it. Give me one second. I'll be right back. Keep going, John. Okay. The Las Vegas Raiders are going to Arrowhead where they're underdogs by seven full points. Give me the Chiefs. Yeah, there's no competition here. The Kansas City Chiefs <clears throat> have looked very good this year. John said that they're his best team in uh, football right now and that I think he changed up his pick and said the Chiefs are going to the Super Bowl this year. So, yeah, give me the Chiefs. Uh, the Raiders have looked god-awful and terrible. I changed my Bucks pick, but I still got the Bills going to the Super Bowl. Okay. Go ahead, Justin. If the Chiefs keep running the football like this, though, I might have to change that. Oh. I said last week that if the Raiders don't pull this one out for me, I'm done with them. I was done. But what did they do? They got a W for your boy. So call me crazy. I'm rolling with the Raiders. And I think they're going to pull one out in Arrowhead and prove a lot of you guys wrong. I think Devontae is going to have a big game. And Josh Jacobs is going to score multiple touchdowns. I think the Raiders beat the Chiefs. If we're going to get crazy here, then I'm just going to take this jersey off and wrap the big baller brand because that is insane. Best team in football right now is the Kansas City Chiefs, and there's no way I can deny that fact. So we're talking about NFL week five in the books we'll see how we do on pick them be sure to come back for episode number 34 to see how we do this upcoming week but now friends we have to move on to basketball because the nba season starts october 18th 12 days away and today we're going to be recapping the entire northwest division look we haven't actually uh, you know said this on air divisions don't matter in basketball sure it can affect the stand or the seating and whatnot but it's not 2007 where you could win the Northwest Division with 46 wins and be the number three seed. doesn't matter anymore for standings, and it's a great thing for the playoffs. Today, we're going to be recapping the Nuggets, T-Wolves, Oklahoma City Thunder, Utah Jazz, and Portland Trail Blazers. And we're going from top to bottom, and it's quite simple to me. The best team in this division, because this is all together regular season and postseason, we're just ranking these five teams by far is the Denver Nuggets. Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. have made their preseason returns, and they both looked very good. Michael Porter Jr. did what he always does. Elite three-point shooting off the catch, very good cutting, offensive rebounding. He's the perfect piece alongside Nikola Jokic. And Jamal Murray is that three-level score they haven't had since he tore his ACL. I look at this Nuggets offense, and there is not a better group in the entire NBA. They have versatility with Aaron Gordon, Bruce Brown, who is the perfect niche player in Brooklyn. Quite honestly, I don't know what the gap is between him and Ben Simmons in the postseason. And not, not in the regular season, but in the playoffs, those are two very similar players. Ben Simmons may be more versatile in defensive ends. I get it. This Nuggets team had themselves a great offseason. In the draft, they go out and get an NCAA champion in Christian Braun out of Kansas. A tough, wiry guard that can shoot the ball. He reminds me a little bit of Alex Caruso and the edge he can bring. And while I'm not sure if he's going to be NBA ready, I do know for darn sure the two-time reigning MVP Nikola Jokic is going to come this season, have a little bit of rest, because over the last two years in the playoffs, he's run out of gas against the Suns and this last year against the Warriors. And I think for a team that has realized that up until this point, he's finally going to get that opportunity to take a backseat role and not have to average 27, 14, and 8 assists as a center, just this team to win 46 games. For you guys, are the Nuggets the best out of these five teams? And I want to hear, what is your X factor at this team? What is the one factor that can take this from a high-level playoff team to an actual NBA champion or just a team that can come out of the Western Conference? I think, uh, for me, I do think the Nuggets are the best team, more so because I don't, I don't know what Cat is going to look like when the season starts for Minnesota, but I like the nuggets. I love, I love the Joker. How can't you? Um, but my X factor is Jamal Murray. He's back in the fold. Uh, I mean, if you have any other answer, I'd be surprised really. It's just to see what this team can look like when they're fully healthy. 
I think Jamal Murray is a star. And I think we haven't seen his best basketball yet because he hasn't been available to us. But hopefully a full season of him and, and the Joker together, I think uh, the sky's the limit for this Nuggets team because they have title aspirations. This isn't just a team that's going in there just to make the playoffs. They have aspirations to win an NBA championship. Uh, yeah, for me, I was just looking for my list of the top uh, five NBA teams that we did earlier um, about a month ago, I think. But I do remember if my recollection um, is correct that I had Denver as a, one of my top five teams. I think I had them at number five. So I'm really high on Denver. So, yeah, they're, they're my number one team in this division. You got the Joker. He's a top 10 player in the NBA. Uh, he's probably the best passing big man of all time already. It, it's just insane. His vision, his IQ and his ability to just pass the ball in, in a creative way or just, you know, regular standard type passes. It, it's just insane. You know, high, high rebound rate, 13, 14 rebounds, 28 points a game. That it, It's just insane. Yeah. He lacks on the defensive end, but when he's giving you MVP uh, production in the offensive end, you can't really um, get mad at it. <clears throat> and he's staying healthy. He's playing what 75 plus games a season, if not 80. This season, you got Jamal Murray come back. You got Michael Porter Jr. coming back. Hopefully, they both stay healthy. I think Murray can stay healthy. I, I don't think he's had injury history like that. Like the torn ACL was the big one for him. And uh, obviously, Porter Jr. has dealt with injury. So he's the one you got to focus on and be like, okay, maybe we need to load manage with him a little bit and make sure that he's healthy for the playoffs because they can make a real run if all three are healthy with an Aaron Gordon. And that bench that's starting to look good, it, it, I love the Denver Nuggets. My X factor is, is going to be Michael Porter Jr. Because if he's on the court, then it's a, it's a, they have their legit big three. I'm excited about the Denver Nuggets. You know, Brandon, if I could hug you as the biggest Jokic fan I'm probably on planet Earth, I would. I, 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 I probably were very far from each other. But, yeah, I'd probably make the trip. Here is the crazy thing about the Denver Nuggets that most fans actually don't realize. So we know Jokic just won the MVP award two straight years. The crazy thing about that is the last time he played with Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr., and Michael Porter Jr. is a rookie at the time, keep in mind, he was a 20-point-per-game score at 10 rebounds. The two years since, he has bumped his scoring tally from 20 a game to 27. Meanwhile, he's averaging more assists, more rebounds, and get this, he's more efficient. We don't see guys typically make that jump so early. I mean, Jokic is still just 27 years old. And it's crazy to think he took an even bigger step on the defensive end. He didn't just, didn't just get better on offense. It was both ends of the floor. And that is the unique thing about this group, that Jokic can actually be a high-level rim protector. Last year, he had, I think, three game-winning blocks. And much like Marcus Saul, he's not going to blow you away athletically. But if you have the right anticipation, the right instincts, and the right positioning, you can still be an above-average defender. But like you said, Brandon, it was really in that Warrior series where in high-leverage pick-and-roll situations, he wasn't going to be Garn, Steph, and Jordan Poole, the force multiplier that dynamic combination is. Because in 27 feet, it's the most slippery tandem in the entire league. But at the end of the day, this Nuggets group has added depth Michael Malone is one of the better coaches in the NBA, and he actually didn't really do a great job last year, especially in the playoffs. He would go with these weird lineups that were all bench, and when Jokic was not on the floor, they really struggled that large part to him. Now Jamal Murray being in the fold, and Bones Highland, Jamal can take some rest, and I think Bones, second-year guard at a VCU, dynamic shot critter that can get downhill and create for teammates, could be in the six-man-of-the-year race. Playing off of Jokic, I'm expecting him to have a very good season, replacing Monte Morse, who they traded for Kentavious Caldwell-Pope. His time in Denver to kind of run its course. Same thing with Will Barton. I think back to this one moment in the first round where him and Will Barton were just looking at, at a defensive rebound, I believe it was, just staring at it. And then some warrior took it and grabbed it. And it, put, it was really bad. Those two guys just struggled to really be at the level the Nuggets needed to as fourth and fifth starters a year ago. So that's all I got on the Nuggets. Michael Porter Jr. to me is the biggest X factor. What will he be and can he stay healthy coming off a of lumbar spine surgery? The dude's just 24 years old. And while I'm not expecting him to have the highest of ceilings, he's not an explosive athlete, doesn't have a great first step, not a good ball handler. 
his fit as one of the five best shooters probably in the entire universe. Playing off for the best passer in the NBA, in my opinion, given the advantages Jokic can create his position, it is otherworldly. And this is a joy to watch in transition and in the half court. Now we have to talk about Carl Anthony Towns and the Minnesota Timberwolves. This is a little bit of a heavier uh, topic. Carl Anthony Towns had a throat infection, and he was stuck to his bed so much, he lost 17 pounds and couldn't even walk for a period of time. Initially, the T-Wolves were my number one seed coming in just a week ago, and little did I know, Cat, after all he's been through personally and on the court, he's missed a lot of time in 2019, 2020, he has another setback that he has to overcome. And for a team in Minnesota that just went all in, they go out and get Rudy Gobert, giving up five first-round picks in the process. They have Anthony Edwards going to his third season. Much like Ja last year, we're expecting them to take that entire level up as a group. This Timberwolves team doesn't have time to just figure this thing out because Rudy is already 30 years old. And there is a level of expectation that comes. Like you guys say with the, t- with the Nuggets, the T-Bulls aren't just in this to make the playoffs. They have to show a stride this year as Gobert is probably in the exact best or last po- This is the end of Gobert's peak. You know, this, you're never going to get a better, a, a better Rudy Gobert than now. I'm going to ask you guys, this is your second team, I would hope, but what is your X factor this year with the T-Bulls if it's not Anthony? Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, they're my second team right now by... Um almost by default because the other three teams are kind of, you know, I mean, OKC has made some strides, but they're not ready yet. Uh, Yeah. I like what you said. I mean, Anthony Edwards, I'm big on him. I know you two are both big on him, especially you, John, you think he can be an MVP caliber player if I'm not mistaken. Um, D'Angelo Russell, he needs to be more consistent as their starting point guard. Carl Anthony Towns prayers go up. I hope that he can get on the court and healthy. I know he's been dealing with a lot, Since the pandemic started, uh, I don't need to list everything, but he's been going through a lot on the court, off the court. So, you know, prayers up to him. I'm pretty sure I saw a report that he just started walking last weekend um, for the first time in a while. So that's a little scary. Um, They're going to have to ease in, ease into him. Uh, But talking about strictly basketball, the Rudy Gobert move for me, it, it still is one of the most, I like shocking moves to me, like five first round picks and players. It's just out of this world for a guy who can't give you anything offensively by himself. It's just ridiculous. Um, I'm not that high on Minnesota. Like John is, I do like their team. They're a playoff team, but I don't think they compete with the, the high end teams in the West. My X factor is. I think. D'Angelo Russell, if he can play at the level we all know he can and expect him to, you know, yeah, I, but he's just so inconsistent, man. He's so inconsistent. Like one game he'll hit like the game-winning shot, ice in my veins, ice in my vein, and the next game he's freaking wh- – where, where is D'Angelo Russell? Is he even playing? It, it's just too much. Last year he averaged uh, – I think it was like nine points in the playoffs and shot below 30%. Yeah, okay, that's a bit much worse than James Harden. Uh, that's not going to cut it. <laughs> oh, no, it was – my apologies. It was 12% 33% shooting. That's even worse than Harden. Oh, my God. Or, no, 12 points per game on 33%. Yeah, still terrible. For me, I, I came into the season very high on the Timberwolves. And like John, I, I think uh, Anthony Edwards' potential is through the roof. I think this is a future MVP candidate for years to come. Uh, so I'd still see this Minnesota team finishing pretty high once Cat gets his, his feet under himself and he gets the ball rolling. Uh, I think he's an absolute animal. So I think Minnesota will be fine. Prayers up to Cat. But like Brandon, I think I have to roll with D'Angelo Russell. It's just so much inconsistency there. That's definitely not what you need when you that's your lead point guard right there. Going into a postseason series, you need somebody that's going to set the tone, that's going to set the floor for your team. And when you don't know what you're going to get every other game from this guy, that's tough. I mean, his regular season numbers, if you're just looking at stats, they always look nice. But we have to read between the lines when it comes to D'Lo. Are you going to be the guy that's going to step up for this team when Anthony Edwards or Cat isn't scoring? Because he has that capability to light up a scoreboard. He does. It's just a uh, uh, left to what, what is he going to be when it matters most? 
And that's a great point. With D'Lo, he's really filled the mold. He's watched a lot of Chris Paul, the playmaking guard that last year still averaged seven points in the playoffs, but he was just such a negative defensively and as a scorer that this is your only point guard. Your backup's Jordan McLaughlin. And the undersold thing about this T-Bowls team is Chris Finch, their third-year head coach now, first year is half the season. He is a brilliant offensive mind. He worked with Boogie Cousins and uh, what's his face? Anthony Davis in New Orleans, worked with Jokic, went to Toronto. He's been all over the league, and everywhere that he's went, they've maximized their offensive, offense's utility. Trading Jared Vanderbilt and stuff for Rudy Gobert, to me, was a great move because offensively, Jared Vanderbilt gave you five points a game last year, and now you're replacing him with a guy in Rudy that was the fulcrum of the number one offense in basketball last year. The Jazz were able to build a unit around his limitations as a post scorer, and he's not gonna—he's not Bam on a bio, let's say, as a versatile scorer. And they had an elite unit because of Donovan Mitchell. Anthony Edwards is not far off from Donovan right now, and that is without an in-between game going to year three. He may not even need an in-between game, a floater, a mid-range shot, because with his burst scoring package and ability to get out in open space, you can't stop Ant-Man. Yeah, there's just. I kind of cheated here. I did, I wanted an opportunity to talk about Ant, so I said outside of him, who is your X Factor with this group, it's undoubtedly him taking that third-year leap. If he does what John Morant did last year as a scorer, because Ja, he really filled more of that Allen Iverson mold. He wasn't as much of a playmaker. If Ant can take that leap, just into a 26-point-per-game guy and the same level of efficiency, this offense is going to be electric. The issue is their depth. You move off of Jared Vanderbilt, you get rid of Malik Beasley, you trade away Patrick Beverly. Those guys in the playoffs were able to, or just in the regular season at least, were able to fill a role. In the playoffs, not as much. Now your bench is slow-mo Kyle, a solid Wayne player that can't really shoot, but just does a lot of the little things. Torrey and Prince, Austin Rivers, Jordan McLaughlin, Nas Reed. If Cats or Rudy Gobert miss time, there's literally no depth at all. And that is the biggest issue when you sacrifice all of that extra stuff for a top three, top four center in the game. Anything else to the T-Bulls? No, sir. So we're moving on to a guy that I compare to Russell Wilson a lot. Both play in the Pacific Northwest. One has a championship, the other one doesn't. And that is one Damian Lillard. Much like Russell Wilson last year in 2021, dealt with a lot of injuries in the NFL, Damian Lillard dropped off from 29 points and eight assists to 24 points, just 29 games, and a level of efficiency in three-point shooting that is not typical for a superstar. Okay, there's an LNBA player of Damian Lillard's caliber. Every single year, Dame has been able to carry this team to the playoffs until he couldn't last year. My question for you guys is, the Trailblazers go on and get Jeremy Grant, the best wing player, or best forward Dame's going to have since LaMarcus Aldridge. Anthony Simons is a guy who broke out for 23 points and six assists, or I think it was like eight or nine when Dame was at a lineup. This Trailblazers team is better than any one they have had post-2015. Will they make the playoffs this season? And I'm about to list to you the playoff teams in this conference because there's about 10 of them. You have the Phoenix Suns, number one seed last year. The Memphis Grizzlies, number two seed last year. Golden State Warriors, the defending champions. The Los Angeles Clippers, maybe the biggest competitor to the throne, the Warriors. The Minnesota Timberwolves, we just talked about. The Denver Nuggets, who have the reigning two-time MVP. That is six teams. Now you have Luka Doncic and the Dallas Mavericks getting Christian Wood. The Los Angeles Lakers, who have championship gravitas. That's eight. And the New Orleans Pelicans, who get Zion Williamson back. That is nine teams right there. And the Kings, too, are trying to win games to Demonte Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox. Can the Trailblazers make it to the postseason with one of the one or two of those teams being behind them in the standings when it's all said and done? Justin, I'll let you go for this one. Uh, I, I think not a chance. Not a chance. I think the Western Conference is just fully loaded. I mean, Brandon said it not too long ago. I mean, are we going to celebrate a play-in? Like, I could see this team making a play-in game, maybe. But saying that they're going to go to the playoffs and be one of the top eight seeds, not a chance. Yeah, for me, no, no, I, I don't. No, they're not making the playoffs. Maybe a play-in, but again, like Justin said, I'm not giving you no goddamn 
respect or admiration for making a play and congratulations you won a participation award i hate the play in just like i hate the seven team pl uh, playoff team in the nfl i just think we're giving a spot to a team that didn't show you all regular season that they deserve a shot and you're just going to give it to them because oh we want more money to have more games it, it's it waters down your product and it's bad for business so yeah, it's very short-sighted on the NBAs to do the uh, play-in. I do agree. I think the play-in is a little bit too extra, but what it does do, Brandon, and incentivizes competitiveness. Yeah, well, you should have been competitive for the whole regular season, and you showed that you weren't. You showed that you were the ninth or tenth team in the NBA in that conference. You showed that. And so now I'm supposed to just, oh, here you go. Here's another game where you can possibly get into the, the uh, uh, playoffs. Because you had, and, and now it's, and I was thinking about this, like now it's just, it's an elimination game. It's a one game series. Like that makes no, that would be like if the NFL had a play in tournament before the playoffs and it was a best of a uh, best of three first team to two wins gets in the playoffs. And then they go to a one game elimination. It makes no sense. Like it should be fair. Anybody can have one great game. Like, let's just say the wizards end up beating a Brooklyn Nets team that's ranked eight, uh, that's eighth seed and the, and the Wizards are ninth or whatever. And they have one great game where Bradley Beal goes off for 50 or whatever. And they're clicking on all cylinders. Like, cause that's happened before. Bad teams can have a great game. And now they just knocked out the Brooklyn Nets where we could have saw Nets Celtics matchup in the first round and Nets Bucks matchup in the first round. It's, it's just bad. It's short-sighted. It's bad for business. When you, you look at it and you're like, Oh, we're getting this money in these viewers for this game, but you're not looking at the big picture and it's just bad for competition and business. I don't like it at all. This isn't, this is the NBA. This isn't the NFL. This isn't the MLB where teams actually have a chance. There's no any given Sunday in the NBA, you know, who is going to be there at the end. Yeah. It's clear as day. And you know who, who else knows this? The teams. Portland knows if they get into, if they get into a playing tournament, they're like, all right, what are we really playing for? This is just for fun now because we're going to get waxed in the freaking first round. They know. Do they? Yes, they know. Every, every NBA team knows that. Do you think the Knicks, if the Knicks got into the eighth seed and they're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Bucks, do you think realistically, outside of us Knicks fans that are going to be rooting our asses off for our team oh, to win? Don't grip me into that. But you know for a fact. You want to know why I say that? Because Damian Lillard is the type of athlete that just has – otherworldly type of optimism and confidence and i have three things to say number one yeah when you have 82 games to decide the top eight teams in a conference you don't need a plan you know who are the top eight squads the trailblazers though going to last year had the longest playoff streak in the entire nba in eight straight years making the postseason and i think for a small market like them there is value in that the only issue is you go to portland and it appears like to me, no one really cares because it's a boring team. Damian Lillard just brings them to the playoffs. They lose in the first round. But this Trailblazers team might just be different. They still have an undersized backcourt. They still have a six foot four small forward, just like they do with Norman Powell. But at the end of the day, there's a new head coach in here in Sean C. Phillips, one that is trying to promote this blitzing style scheme with a bunch of great athletes, kind of like the T Wolves had with Jared Vanderbilt last year and all those other athletes. So they go out and get Gary Payton from the Warriors, steal him from a competitor. Nasir Little's coming off of a torn labrum and his surgery on that, very good athlete. Shaden Sharp, maybe the best athlete from this last year's draft, just a level of athleticism that is not okay for an 18 or 19 year old. And of course, Jeremy Grant from the Pistons, who is a fine above average starting small forward or power forward. And Josh Hart, Josh Hart, is one of the most underrated role players in basketball. A guy that when you get him into open space is an absolute bowling ball, very good on ball defender, very versatile in the way he can play make, rebound, and most of all, last year, he was averaging almost 20 points in the 13 games he played with the team. This Trailblazers team is much better than the iteration that made it to the conference finals in 2019 and won 53 games. There is a case to be made in NBA where the Lakers are injury prone, the Nuggets, their second and third best players are coming off of serious injuries. We don't know what's going on with Carl Anthony Towns. There's uncertainty every year in the NBA. And because of that, just like we saw a year ago when, I don't know, or two years ago when the Knicks made it to the number four seed, no one thought they were a top four team in the Eastern Conference. But that stuff can happen when the right opportunities open. And you have Damian Lillard, to me, is a franchise player. He is that good. He just never has had the star talent around him. This team still doesn't quite have the star talent.
But in a way, Anthony Simons is one of the biggest breakout candidates this upcoming season, a guy that was a borderline all-star last year with opportunity. So I don't think it's fair to just write this team off and cut of their pass because they could surprise a lot of people to make the playoffs. Okay, but what do we consider successful for the Portland Trailblazers? Winning a playoff series. Okay, and, and I'll be honest with you, that's not going to happen. It, it, it's just not. I, I think Portland this year is making the playoffs. That's success. I, I think that that'll be successful. Playoff series. That would be like the holy grail if they won a freaking playoff series, especially in the West. Get out of here with that. Yeah, I Move think the West is way too deep. And realistically, I, and I guess I'm not trying to take a shot at the NBA when I say if you're the six seater below, you're, you're, you're really not being entertained when it comes to the playoffs. You're really not. I mean, who's the who's the lowest seed to ever win an NBA Finals? Wasn't it the Rockets? At the sixth seed. And the last eighth seed to make the NBA Finals, if I'm not mistaken, was the Knicks. Eighth seed, yeah. It, it, it just mm-hmm. doesn't it just doesn't happen mm-hmm. so i mean i can't even see portland pulling out a series especially if they squeeze their way to the eighth seed and they're going toe-to-toe with the denver nuggets or the clippers uh, i i don't think they, they stand a single chance and the, and the west is so deep a lebron team could finish seventh in the west and they actually have a chance why because it's lebron yep that's the other that's the other dad is kind of the fine line. I try to play Dell's advocate with this team, but you are right about that. Last two teams in the conference, the Utah Jazz and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Between them, I think the Thunder have a top twenty five, top thirty player in Shea. So I have them getting the nod. But Shet Holmgren, Liz Frank, injury, he will not play as a rookie. And this Thunder group is really shaping up to be a tanktastic team a reference that many people have used Shea has a sprained mcl so he's gonna miss a little bit of camp and ultimately with no chet holmgren they make one of the most bizarre trades last week trading their starting center and Derek favors to the rockets outside of josh giddy in year two there's really nothing to be excited about with this thunder team i still had them coming in fourth though because of how good Shea is who do you guys have for yeah i have i have okc and it's simply because they got a lot of young talent that they're building to the future for Uh, Some people even think a little bit too much of young talent Uh, and and simply because the Utah Jazz are in complete start over and rebuild mode. I mean, they're they're not really hiding that for anybody. Uh, I would imagine Mike Conley, if they can't find a trade partner, I I don't know, maybe he's going to be bought out or just, yeah, bought out probably. It's just, yeah, Utah is in complete, Danny Age is in complete rebuild mode and they're, they're building for like a way in the future. Yeah, I'm with you guys. Uh, OKC is my, my next team on in this division. Shea is an absolute monster. Part of me just wants things to go terrible so he could be a, another trade candidate for the Knicks, but I'm over that. It's not going to happen. So, uh, yeah, I'll roll with OKC. I think they got a special young group. I don't see anything crazy happening with them, but Josh Giddy's the man too. So uh, I'd like to see another, another year out of him, see him step up. So in the offseason, this team extended Lou Dort for $87 million. Before that point, he was playing basically on a minimum contract and giving them 17 points per game and basically elite perimeter defense. The unique thing with this Oklahoma City group is, unlike most rebuilding teams, they actually play defense. And that is a testament, one, to their head coach, Mark Dagnall, a guy who was, he's a young coach, worked his way up from the NBA G League, and has promoted a, a style where this team is going to compete. And they are, at the end of the year, going to blow things up. They're going to rest Josh Giddy. They're going to make sure Shea's not playing because he's just too... His scoring package, this is a guy who can score from all three levels, has amazing footwork, shifty, burst, the, the all-around in-between game. He can snatch back, hit you with a killer crossover. He gets the rim, ambidextrous ball handler. He is the go-to funky guard that any team wishes they could have. He'll give you 24 and 7 or 8, eight assists a game. I think he could break out on a team that's actually trying to win games. It's not going to happen this year. The X factor with this team, in my eyes, is Jalen Williams. Justin, this team made a deal with your squad in the draft, trying up to get Usman Dien using the next number 11 pick. And then number 12, they're going to get Santa Clara's Jalen Williams, the good one, a very, much like Shea, lengthy forward that can dribble, shoot, and pass at a pick and roll. Very dynamic wing player that, Broke out in his third year playing at Santa Clara. The last Santa Clara first-round pick was Steve Nash. So it was a small school unknown. Um, But the kid is very dynamic. And he's going to get a lot of playing time this year because he's more NBA ready than Usman Dien. And I think that team is trying to lose games. It's going to be fun to watch this group. They're just 
not going to have more than like, let's say 25 wins due to Chet being injured. Yeah, not much more to say on that. I mean, pretty much cleared it. They're going to lose games. End of story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a top five pick. And we saw Victor Wembanyama and Scoot Henderson play the other night. And I think they're going to get one of those two prospects. They'll be in the top four with that doubt. And for a team that hasn't hit the lottery yet up until this point, they got the second overall pick last year, but it's not the best luck. I feel like next year we're going to look at this team and they're going to get Victor Wembanyama. I think they're going to win the sweepstakes and Chet coming off of injury. That right there with Shea, Josh Giddy, Lou Dort, Jalen Williams is a team in the next four or five years will be much like that 2011 Oklahoma City team that we're saying, oh, they're about to go to the finals. And what did they do in 2012? They went to the finals with Kevin Durant in 23. So I'm excited to see their future. But until then, it's Tank City in Oklahoma City. Now, last but not least is Danny Ainge's Utah Jazz, a team that is the second longest playoff streak in the NBA, six years. They have you know, made some moves this summer, to the very least. Rudy Gobert gets moved for five first-round picks. Donovan Mitchell gets moved for, I think it was four first-rounders, and a handful of young players. They have rookies coming in, O.J. Abaji, another NCAA champ uh, out of Kansas, very good winning player. He reminds me a little bit of Contavious Caldwell-Pope and Walker Kessler. But the theme with this team is they're going to be bad, really bad. Colin Sexton's going to get buckets as a starting point guard. They're going to have floor spacing and Laurie Markkinen, Malik Beasley, and Jordan Clarkson. Not a great shooter, but he's a spark plug off the bench. And until Mike Conley is somewhere else, he is a mentor for this young talent they have acquired. And Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Taylor Horn Tucker, Jared Butler, and Jared Vanderbilt's also a young player. My question for you guys is, what is the exciting part of this team? Outside of Colin Sexton getting buckets, is there a player here that you look forward to seeing? In no. A, uh, no, not one. No, well, I'm not going to watch the Utah Jazz, sorry. I think that the most exciting part of this team is to find out where they're picking in the draft. <laughs> I mean, they're in complete rebuild mode. They're trading everybody away. So uh, I'm not going to give them the time of day. Uh, if they start making some really good moves and in the future, you know, three, four, five years down the line, maybe I'll start watching them again. But I'm not going to waste my time on a team that's going for a top three pick in the draft. Yeah, I guess the only thing that to be excited about is that Danny Ainge, you know, is preparing for the future. And so they have a lot to look forward to there. Obviously, it sucks because if you're a fan base, you want to see your team, your team win. And it's clear as day that they're punting the season. So to go into a season, you're like, damn, this is what I have to look forward to as a fan. That kind of sucks. So that's disappointing. But in the future, like, like Brandon said, in, in a couple of years, we'll see where these draft picks get them. They have so many locked and loaded now. Uh, Danny Ainge is a smart man. So we'll see how he builds this team in the future. I try to play devil's advocate with all these groups because every team in the NBA is going to have young players. And for this group, they're rebuilding, but they're at ground zero. And typically at this point, like the Rockets, and they move James Harden, like the Thunder, and they move Russell Westbrook, there's not much to be excited about but the draft. So the X factor with this team, to me, is a guy, Malik Beasley, who has shown the upside to score 20 a game as a borderline elite three-point shooter. I think this year is his opportunity to kind of... Uh, it's his tryout to get traded to a contender. We may see Malik Beasley on a team like the Lakers. The Miami Heat is bringing a real spark off of their bench, making a difference. Where that starts is with him playing at a high level on a crappy team. The young player I'm most excited to see is Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Shea's cousin from Toronto. Lanky, lengthy guard that finishes at an elite level and can really handle and pass creatively. But he just can't shoot the ball, has a funky-looking jump shot, and is inconsistent as an off-ball defender. This is his last opportunity as the former number 17 overall pick. The Pelicans moved him to the, I think it was the, the Trailblazers. Blazers moved him to Utah. This is his last chance in the NBA to really show himself as a first-round talent. But anything else you guys got before we kick, kick, kick this entire thing off? Oh, I'm good. Ready for football. Nothing. Ready for football. You're ready for football. I'm ready for football. What I'm also ready for is Victor Wembanyama next season. Special, special talent the GM's been looking for the last 15, dec last 15 years. Let me repeat that. Victor Wembanyama is the prospect, NBA draft prospect. Victor Wembanyama is the prospect NBA GMs have been looking for the last 15 years. A seven foot four Kevin Durant, basically, that has the length, ball handling, and the fluidity as an athlete to take over and be a talent this league hasn't seen since Kevin Durant came in 2007. It is ridiculous the stuff he can do off the dribble. 
and as a uh, you know step back pull up three point shooter, uh, it, not okay. It's the NBA might be in some trouble if that guy can have a long career. But mm. all that being said, uh, that was one thing for you guys. I'm, I urge you guys because I know you guys aren't the biggest baseball fans in the world. The postseason starts on Friday, which is tomorrow. All right, Brandon. Look at me. Look me in the eyes. Look me in the eyes. All right. I know you're not a fan, but this is the greatest version of baseball you will ever see. Watching the most insane fan bases get into it from pitch one to the last out of the game. You're going to see the Cleveland Guardians fans because it's the wild card round. All these fans are, are going to be at home. It's a three game series at home. The Guardians fans are going to go crazy. The Cardinals fans, probably one of the greatest fan bases in baseball. The Blue Jays, oh my gosh. You can, your TV shakes watching the fans go crazy in Toronto. And then the Mets are taking on the Padres as well uh, in New York. I'll be going to the game on Saturday night, without a doubt. And then Tuesday, my Yankees get going. So guys, I urge you, this weekend, Friday, Saturday, fine. You want to take a break from it on Sunday? I won't blame you because it's football. But you have no excuse Watch some playoff baseball for me. Please. You too, John. Nothing? I can't make you that promise. <laughs> oh, no. I got it. One game? I can't. Oh, look at this. There we go. Busy man. This is my only baseball jersey, my friend. Who is it? Albert Pools. Oh, good man. Good man. Good man. I like <sighs> it. I got my Yadier Molina one in my closet. Good, good. I'm, I'm pumped up, guys. But, yeah, that's all I got to say before I got to bounce to work. I got to bounce to a dentist appointment. So, with all that being said, thank you so much for sticking around. Episode number 33. Be sure to check out that stamp link in the description. And, as always, we'll see you next time. Stay classy. <laughs>